This episode was brought to you by Big Moose. Find out about the One Million Project at bigmoosecharity.co. Pals, pals, greetings. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Everything Endurance. It is, as ever, a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for being here. Genuinely, we we may not be hitting like a weekly release schedule, but we are starting to sneak the episodes out a bit more regularly, which is great. We're going to stick to this for a while. We're putting together bigger episodes. We're digging a little deeper. Uh, we are getting more interesting guests for you to talk to, and we are releasing them as and when we've got them ready. We're not going to keep you waiting any longer than we absolutely have to. So welcome. I am back in your ears today. To, uh, to talk about the Highlands specifically. Um, that's the trip I've recently come back from. That's where I've just been. Um, I've been up to the West Highlands of Scotland for Highland Ultra 2023. Uh, now, I'm, you are going to hear a lot over the course of the episode of me wanging on at length about how amazing I think this place is. Um, anybody who's seen... Uh, any of Beyond the Ultimate output over the course of the Highland Ultra just just at the end of April will already know. Like I, it was Christmas for me as a photographer being out there in that place. It is absolutely stunning. So plenty to talk about. Quite a long episode. You are going to hear from some of the runners who took part in the race. You're going to hear from the people who won it. You're going to hear about how their training worked, what was good for them, what didn't work so well, what they found difficult about the race, what they enjoyed, recommendations for anyone who's thinking of doing this race, which of course is going to apply to anyone who's thinking of running anywhere particularly lumpy like this. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna dive into little conversations with those runners, and we've got three of them today on account of the fact that the winners of this race were winners plural. Um, Fred and Axel are both going to be talking to us together as the people who crossed the line together, um, and then we're going to be talking to Lauren Gregory, um, and yeah, all of those conversations are great and really interesting as well. Some of these guys are not coming from where you think they would come from as a winner of a race this difficult. Um, very interesting stuff to come. Then we're going to get into some much wider issues than that. And, and I'm, I'm very excited about this. One of the things that I really, really enjoy about heading up to the Highlands for the Highland Ultra is the community that's there. It's, it's really easy to talk about the Highlands and only talk about how incredibly beautiful the scenery is. And of course it is, but that's ignoring really the, one of the richest aspects of the area. And that is the community living there. And it's a small community. We're, we're talking 120, 130 people living there, um, living there in, on the Noidart Peninsula. And the way that they are working together and integrating for the good of their community and for the much wider, greater good far beyond that. The the conservation efforts that this community are engaged in are incredibly compelling. And every time I go away from Inverie, I come back with some hope. Uh, genuinely, I come back from spending a few days around these people with genuine hope for the future, that, that we can find ways of working together, that we can find sustainable options and community projects that are really positive and can have much wider reaching effects than you'd, than you'd imagine. We're going to dive into what those guys get up to in Noida. We're going to dive into as beautiful as the area is, we're going to dive into how the area should look or looked before human interaction started changing the whole landscape around. And we're going to look into how the Highland Ultra as a race links with that and, and how we are working together, again, just inspired by that community who all pitch in together to help get done what they need get uh, need to get done. We are doing our best to be a part of that community with the race as well and giving something back to them that is useful. And we're going to dive deeply into that. Uh, so definitely, definitely do stick around. Both Lorna and Finlay from the Forest Ranger Service have loads of really interesting stuff to say. So yeah, you've got that to look forward to as well. So uh, let me just recap that for a second. That was three interviews with winners of the race. 
plus two interviews with people who represent some of the amazing projects there on Noid Art. This is it. This is what I've tried to give you is the, the holistic view, the whole of the Highland Ultra in one big lump. Now, as usual with these big episodes, I've done my best to stick some time codes and stuff like that down in the descriptions. So if you are not there thinking I'm going to sit down and listen to this whole two and a half hour long or whatever it is this episode comes out as in the end, do not worry. You can dip in and out. You can come back and grab the bits that you want to grab later on. You listen to this at your leisure. This is for you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not going to hold you up too much more before we go into that. Um, I also want to mention towards the end of the episode, we've got another incredibly positive um, update from our man in America, Adam Kimball. We have another radness update sat there waiting for you. And just to sort of tie into the theme of the episode, we are going to be talking about positive movements within the ultra running community and and what it is that seems to drive some of us to want to do positive things for the wider community and for the world beyond that. Um, it, he's got some great stuff to say. It's impossible to listen to five minutes of Adam Kimball without ending up with a smile on your face. I love tucking him in there at the end of the episode because it means just as just as we go in the sign off, just as those, just as that ending music comes in, you're just feeling genuinely good about your day. So thanks very much once again to Adam Kimball for that. Okay, we're going to start getting into it. Um, but before we dive too deeply and exclusively into some Highland Ultra stuff. Just an acknowledgement of the fact that we're into May, we're into spring, we're getting into summer, and we are starting to enter FKT season again. Um, my Twitter feed is once more again awash with runners out there doing the absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the one that leapt out for me over the last few days, obviously, we've got Andy Berry out there on a new Lake District 24-hour fell record outrageous 78 summits in the lake district in 23 hours and 23 minutes massive congratulations to you andy um and one that really stuck out for me is james gibson um and this is treading new ground this one uh, as opposed to sort of breaking a record from where we were in Inverie and a little further around the peninsula, it was clear enough during this last event for us to see all the way across to the Isle of Skye, which isn't that far, and to see the whole of the Collin Ridge out there on the horizon. And it is ridiculous. If you haven't seen it before, it looks like something straight out of Lord of the Rings. It is a wall of jagged rock, broken teeth rising up out of the landscape. It, it, it could not look gnarlier it absolutely could not and there's james gibson in 24 hours doing 70 summits along the column ridge that is absolutely outrageous and in such a remote area to be doing this kind of thing as well so congratulations to james congratulations to andy we have set the ball rolling it would appear on another summer of doing the outrageous in ultra running so yeah that's definitely enough rambling from me um, I know I often say that and then it just leads into me rambling for another couple of minutes, but I'm serious this time. Let's let's talk to some runners. Um, definitely, definitely hang on for the conversations with Lorna and with Finley after we've spoken to the runners. They've got some incredibly interesting and positive stuff to say there. Um, but we are going to talk to the winners of the Highland Ultra. We're going to talk to them about their race we're going to talk to them about the race what was good what was bad what worked what didn't we've got some really interesting viewpoints here as well because we've got lauren gregory our winning woman who is a you know she's a pt she is a running coach this is her bread and butter this is how she lives her life and then we've got axel and frederick who seem to have glided in from scandinavia and just blasted their way through this course um obviously we know both of them have a lot of form when it comes to being strong runners but what they don't have is a lot of experience in this kind of environment in this kind of race so much was new to them and they formed a little duo and got each other through and there's loads of inspirational stuff there for people who are maybe at that stage of sort of just getting into ultra running they, they these guys are here today to prove to you that it doesn't have to be your full-time job being an ultra runner for you to be out there on the podium and of course, we've got an introduction to the Highland Ultra from Nick Watson. And Nick Watson is the sadistic person who dreamt up this course. He is our course director. He is the person who first came to us and said, look, be on the ultimate. I've raced with you. 
you seem like good guys. I want to take you to the best place I know and put a race on there. And we trusted him and we followed him. And now here we are doing podcasts about it. Um, so yeah, we, we're going to go straight into that. Rather than me waffling on too much, we're going to let Nick Watson talk to you about the Highland Ultra. And this is very specific. This was recorded on the morning of stage one on the beach in Inverie. So both forgive me for a little background noise, um, but also you're going to hear Nick talk quite specifically about the conditions that this year's runners were going to be running into just to set the scene before we go into talking to our winners this year. So yeah, without further ado, here's Nick Watson. So, hi everybody, uh, I'm Nick Watson. So I'm the course director for the Beyond the Ultimate Highland Ultra. So my role really was, well, originally coming up with the harebrained idea to bring people to this beautiful part of Scotland. And I spent quite a long time designing the route in my head. Uh, and then uh, fortunately, Chris and I met many years ago in one of his races. And uh, from there, we put the race together. Um, together. And uh, yeah, so pretty proud of it. And I think we are bringing people to one of the most spectacular parts of Scotland. It's been my playground for 25, 30 years of running, walking, mountaineering, climbing in the hills. And this is without a doubt, one of the best parts to come to. Um, so the first day, the first day begins a bit gently. It's a nice, easy, well, easy is the wrong word, but it's a nice gentle start for them. They're, they're along the, the, a road in, um, from out from Inverie. It's an unusual road because it's not linked to the rest of the mainland, so you can't get to it. Um, so the only vehicles on it are those of the locals, the 120, 130 people who live here. Uh, after that, they, they, they begin on a bit more trail, and then the trail gets more and more remote as they head over, in fact, in the background there, um, past the, the, the hill on the left, which is Lunamain, and they head over that way towards Kinloch Horn. So today's about 48 kilometres. Um, it, 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 has, it has two very different characters. The first bit is quite benign, quite fun. The second bit gets far more remote, far more rugged. Um, and there's a big climb there from sea level, which is fairly obvious given where we're standing, um, right up to 400 meters. Uh, and then back down the other side to sea level again. And then along a beautiful trail into Kinloch Horn, which is where camp, camp one is. And then day two, day two is the big day in some ways. Distance wise, it's a bit shorter than day one, but there's, there's a lot more vert. So it's a real test. I always use the word patience for day two. Um, kind of put times out the window. It's all about the, 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 the climbing, the descending, and that's pretty much the character of the entire day. Um, there's some, again, incredibly varied terrain. They're up high in, in some, 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 of the, some of the peaks, um, but also down in some beautiful glens, beautiful valleys, um, with some really nice runnable sections um, sort of interspersed in between. And then day three, day three is gonna depend slightly, as you can probably see in the background, is a little bit of snow. We thought it'd be a bit more Scottish if we put some snow on for, for everybody. Um, but there's two or three options which we'll, which we'll take depending on what the weather's like um, and, uh, and how long we think it's sensible to send people up top. Um, and, and, but either way, it's still a fantastic and beautiful day, which brings us back here for a great party at the end of it all. Uh, so having spent, as I say, 25, 30 years in Scotland, uh, well, all my life in Scotland, but uh, 25, 30 years playing in the hills, this is particularly hard to predict this one. Um, the, the forecast, all of the forecasts are saying low confidence. There's a couple of fronts moving around. Uh, I mean, this is fantastic. It was meant to be raining a bit more than it is now. It's changed overnight. Um, there was some rain during the night. In fact, that snow was from last night. Um, so I, I, my, yeah, my gut feel is this will be the character of the morning, which is lovely. I mean, it's about as perfect running conditions as you can get. And then I think the wind will pick up a bit and they'll get a little bit hosed in the early afternoon. Um, but uh, hopefully they're most of the way over towards camp, uh, or towards the, the, the camp tonight by that point. Um, thereafter, uh, it's, it really is a difficult one to predict. I th I, someone said to me, do you think it's going to be summery, spring, autumn or winter? And I said, yep, probably all of those today and all of those tomorrow. So I think it'll be a bit of that. Um, but to be honest, if it, even if it does rain a little bit, if, they get, if they've got visibility and views like this, I think they'll be able to, to, to handle whatever gets thrown at them. So before we start talking a bit more broadly to the guys from the Noidart Foundation, let's get into it. Let's talk to our Highland Ultra 2023 winners. Good afternoon then. Axel, how are you? I'm good. How are you? 
Yeah, I'm very, very well, thank you. Um, I, I wasn't going to mention this again, but I've I promised myself that it would be the first thing I asked. Is Axel a name that dude out of Guns N' Roses stole from you, or were you? <laughs> did were your parents inspired by Welcome to the Jungle? I'm I'm uh, just checking. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, great name anyway, and I believe that was the first thing I said to you when I met you in Noidart as well. That, like, I think it was, yeah. Name. Um, yeah, so met you, congratulated you on how good your uh, name was. Three days later, you're having a medal put around your neck as the winner of or joint winner of the Highland Ultra. I, I barely know where to start here because I know this was... You you consider yourself more of a road runner than yeah. trail, and this is one of the most technically difficult trail races that I've seen up close. You you haven't run a lot of ultras before, and here we are on a three day, hundred and twenty five kilometer event spread over three days. Like there are so many firsts layered in this for you. Yeah, I, I just think that's incredible. So from the top, what? Were you already somebody with a strong sporting background? Would you would you consider yourself a runner? Is that something you've been doing for a long time? Yeah, yeah, I would say I, I played soccer. I played hockey from my entire youth uh, and done a lot of running and I've always been good at it, but I never competed or anything and I've never been training under a coach or anything all by myself. And I just... I've just enjoyed it over the years, and uh, and, and I realized a couple of years ago that I'm I'm pretty good at it. So I've I've started to do some half marathons and marathons, and, and now this, and I just enjoy it. Uh, yeah, amazing. And and this is a very different set of skills. Like you you talk about half marathons, and you you yeah. said just before I started recording that you previously considered yourself more of a sort of road runner that does fast races. Yeah. What. Did you, was this a big leap for you? Like, did you do a lot of training that was specific to trail before coming to the Highland or did you just have no. to learn everything on day one? No, not at all. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, I, I, I love being in the, in the outdoors and, and hiking in, in the winter and summer. And I've done a lot of that. So I'm, I'm very comfortable, like staying in a tent or taking care of myself in the outdoors. And I love running. So combining those two things was pretty much what I wanted to do and which, what this race was perfect for doing. But honestly, I, I had a, a nagging hip injury uh, for a year and a half, and I just wanted to have a race to look forward to. So I, I, I saw this race, I think it was on Instagram or on Facebook, or and I signed up for it, and I thought it would be a good motivation to, to do all the rehab stuff and all the non-running training, which I, of course, didn't enjoy as much as running. Yeah. Uh, and coming into the race, I mean, uh, I would consider, I think I had a couple of runs before the race where my hip was all right and good, but I don't think I did more than two or three big runs, like 20, 30K runs before the race. Uh, so, I mean, I I didn't train specifically for this race, which I paid for. In the end, I had some very sore feet. Uh, but besides that, no, I, I didn't do any specific training, I would say. I, I no, not at all. Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, that's incredible and congratulations. Um, I, I mean, I don't want this to act as a recommendation to anybody else planning on signing up that you can just turn up without <laughs> thinking about it. Um, uh, Axel here is something of a miracle, but that's, that's absolutely amazing. You, you must have learned so much over the first day or two of this race. Like, w w can you describe that experience like of, of being out on these Scottish trails for the first time? Oh yeah. I mean, I went into the race with basically two goals and, and the first one was just to complete all three stages. Um, that was my main goal, um, especially considering like previous hip injury and, and so forth. And to my second goal was to stay as comfortable for as long as possible. Uh, so those were the only goals I had. I didn't go into it like thinking I could compete with anybody or I didn't even consider that. So, I mean, I just tried to stay comfortable. I met up with Frederick very soon in the race, very, very early on, and, and we just got along and I just, we just kept going and, and, um, learned as we, as we went. He had more experience than I did, uh, from these sorts of races. And, uh, I mean, I, I felt comfortable and I think, um, 
but all of that has to do with, I mean, I didn't do very specific training for this race, but I have trained for a long, long time, like cardio, um, training. And I think that paid off here. I mean, I tried to, to consistently do good training and, uh, I think that's what these races are about, you know, to be consistently good and keep just grinding over the days and that's what pays off. Well, yeah, absolutely. Although I guess your your sort of high level of cardio fitness will have paid off at a number of points because, uh, you know, we think of ultra races as very slow grinding things. Yeah. But there are some really intense, like, workouts during the Highland Ultra. Some some places where you might not be moving quickly, but you're going almost vertically on the trail. <laughs> yeah. Like, sure. um, I mean, uh, how did you find that? Were there any parts of the course that you were surprised that you were allowed out onto how how gnarly was it out there oh i think on the second day i think the second day was definitely the hardest one uh i think we had a steep climb right from the start and then we had a very very steep downhill and i think i slipped like 10 or 12 times just going down one of those uh, hills to the first checkpoint and i think that was the, the 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 toughest part for me uh and i mean the race course, it, it was amazing, but you know, you went down all these hills and up all these climbs and then you turn back and it's like, there's a nice road going like very close to where we just ran, but we didn't use it. <laughs> so we always went the hard path, uh, but I, I, I really enjoyed the course. It was, it was great. And then especially the second day. No, that's great to hear. Yeah, we know that second day is incredibly tough, but you, you are earning the beautiful views up there. Yeah, like, sure. Yeah. Yeah, just absolutely, absolutely stunning. Um, okay, well, look, you having... Oh, one thing I want to check, actually. Did you know Frederick before this race? Oh, no, not at all. We we met, I think, around 100, 150 meters, just coming up next to him, and we that just... must we have been before there. the first corner. Yeah, like. just before the first corner, yeah. And, and uh, uh, I spoke to him, I realized he was Norwegian, I'm Swedish, so we have a lot in common, and we just said to each other, like, let's just try to pace this together, and if you feel good, if I feel good, just keep going, and there's no commitments here to, to stay for and wait for the other person, just keep going. Um, but we stayed together all through the race, and I think that was one of the main ingredients for a successful race for both of us. I mean, we could pace each other. We could uh, uh, remind each other to eat, to fuel. Uh, so, I mean, that was, to me, a winning was one part of the experience, but meeting Frederick and all the other racers was an, an, an equally as big uh, experience for me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, we we try and make sure that's a big aspect of the races that we put on. We We know how important that is which you've struck upon there you know we we tell people if you're going to be among the slower end of the race if you're a little nervous if you haven't got a lot of experience it's all about the power of the pack body up with people who will help you make sure that you're doing all the right things as you go along at the front end of the race where people are actually going for a spot on the podium that's where we see a lot of very lonely runners people who get out towards the front and don't see another soul until they get to the checkpoints. It's really unusual to have two people right at the front and be able to help each other out uh, yeah. as a as a little pair at the front like that. And it worked so well. We, we were not worried about you two at all. You just looked <laughs> incredibly relaxed at, at any time yeah. anybody saw you. And that, that takes teamwork you you oh, can yeah. only be that relaxed because you are each taking some of the load from each other and and helping each other along and i i just think that's fantastic so i'm assuming then there was never any talk of a sprint finish of one of you trying to take the, no, the no. position. no i, I think some, some people tried to push us to do the sprint finish uh and i, I think even frederick mentioned that he had a nightmare before the third stage that i would sprint coming into the like last kilometers or two but i mean i i couldn't been able to do that i too my feet were too sore <laughs> so i'm just happy no one sprinted i mean we were talking about it at the finish line as we were waiting for you two to come in just can you imagine if one of them trips the other up like, <laughs> after all this time of helping each other along they just decide to go for the medal like, but no i'm i'm very very glad that you didn't that was that was great to see you two it was great energy when you crossed that finish line 
So, Axel, you've done this incredible thing. You've come into this completely new and done incredibly well at it. You must have learned a lot along the way. So if I'm listening to this podcast because I think I'm going to enter this race next year, what what should I know? What what do you think worked for you in training or didn't yeah. work? You know, what kit was priceless? That yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Do as much training as you can with your backpack on, I think. It's a, a very good thing you can do to prepare yourself. Um, I used my hiking poles almost all the time, both going up and going down. That was an invaluable equipment for me. Uh, I would definitely bring them again. That's uh, always controversial. There are some runners that just hate them and won't yeah. bring them. And everyone I know who's used them on the Highland Ultra has been glad they had them with them. Oh, yeah, sure. By far my, my most valuable piece of equipment. Uh, and I think that the third tip for me, I mean... I've done, like I said, um, marathons before, and one of my biggest flaws has always been my fueling, that I don't eat enough and I don't drink enough. And this time I just forced myself to eat like every 30 minutes or so. And I ate like candy, it was like power bars and gels and, and, and a good amount of water. And I think I stayed comfortable for so long because I fueled correctly. Uh, so get used to your fueling strategy and make sure that you fuel even when you don't feel like it, because you can like candy as much. I mean, you can love it, but when you're out there for six or seven hours, you don't want to eat candy anymore, but you should. So I think, yeah, train with your backpack, see what kind of equipment works for you for me with the hiking poles and make sure your fueling strategy is, is, uh, is uh, good. And, and you've tried it before. Because the fueling is tough, right? Yeah. Something that you really enjoyed on day one, you might never want to eat again by day two. Yeah, for sure. But you, yeah. you have to start thinking of the food as just fuel, yeah. as something that you'll get a return on if you put it in. And I think I think you're absolutely right there. People get to a point where they don't want to eat. And they, they even come to a point where they have a kind of cavalier attitude to food, like, oh, I ran the last 20 kilometers on one grape. Oh, but, yeah great i bet you feel terrible <laughs> <laughs> and i think i mean it's especially important for these kind of multi-stage races i mean if you're doing a an ultra for a day or so i mean you, you can probably manage it but for three days no there's no way we will do it absolutely you're not going to get time you get time to recover between each stage in that you get to sleep and eat but you're never going to recover you, you you're going to be in a calorie deficit and that's only going to get worse as those three days go on so you've you've got to be cautious on day one if, if to be in the running on day three right yeah definitely yeah did you like where did you go to figure this stuff out before the race or does does this stuff just come from you having experience of looking after yourself in the outdoors? Yeah, yeah, I would say. I mean, um, uh, the fueling thing I learned from from previous like running races and, and, and that sort of thing, and and just the back. I mean, being able to hike and run with my backpack comes from my time in the outdoors, so I was quite comfortable. And I, I mean, I did a lot of research. Uh, I tried to find the best equipment. I tried to. I mean, I looked at all pictures from previous races tried to see what other people were utilizing and i read blog posts and so forth so just i mean preparing mentally and preparing in the form of like getting the right equipment and not just getting the equipment but also know how to use it is also a very big part of these races and you i mean it pays off if you've done your work absolutely I, I, I wish I could have that printed on a t-shirt or a banner or something that I can hold up in front of people that sign up for these events. It's not just race week. You know, the no. more work you do in those months or even years for some people leading up to the race, the better week you can have when you get there. But you've got to do the research. You've, you've got oh, to yeah. do that admin. Yeah. And I mean, being outdoors, hiking, sleeping in a tent, I mean, very non-running specific kind of activities those things will prepare you for a, a race like this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it's it's hard to talk about the Highland Ultra without talking about Noidart itself. And, you know, I'm I'm from the UK. 
and I didn't I wasn't ready for the West Highlands until I saw them. You know, the the first time I drove through Glencoe, even on the way up towards that yeah. part of the country, my mind was blown. But Noidart's incredible. It, it, it it's like somebody made it up for a film. It, it it's it's absolutely stunning to rain. I realize now I'm saying all the things that I really was trying to drive you to say here, but I, it, talk to me about Noidart because anyone listening to me saying how beautiful this place is, is just going to think I'm biased. So c- can you try and describe Noidart to us? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the race is one big part of the experience, but Noidart and the, the, the small town there and the, the hills and all of that, that's, for me, that's also a big part of the experience. It's like, like you said, it's one of those places you see in a movie. You don't think they exist in reality. And and being, and 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 staying there and getting to see the community and the nature and get to talk to the rangers and all of that. To me, I mean, most people who do these races, they love the outdoors and they want to go to places most people don't go to. And I mean, this place is just, it's just incredible. It's uh so I think it's hard to describe and it. I think if you like running, I mean, this is a good race, but if you like the outdoors and if you like to see new places, this is, this is as a valid thing. I mean, it, it it's, uh, it's one of many good things about the race. And it's, I mean, it, it's an incredible place. Yeah. I'm really glad you think so. And it- I mean, I'm blown away by it. I love uh, Inveries, such a great little community yeah. and the community ownership of the land that they're on now and the way that they're rewilding the area and, and the conservation projects that they're putting together. It's all so positive. And we want everyone to come away having having noticed that. Yeah. The, the point was never for us to just pick some pretty hills in the highland and go there and come and come back again. Wherever we take people, we want them to see this amazing place and meet people who are from there and get to know it a little bit so it's it's really good to hear that you feel like you got that out of it oh yeah for sure yeah absolutely yeah excellent well that's that's fantastic and look uh, i'm not going to keep you for much longer axel um i I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today Uh, has this inspired something in you do you see more ultra marathons in your future yeah i mean I think what I love the most about this race is that you get to talk to all these other people. I think it's a very niche kind of sport and you don't get to know. I mean, I don't have a lot of friends here doing the same kind of ultras and running and and so forth. I think that that's the same for most people. So get to meet all these people and talk to them about other races they have done and other races you're going to do. I I get very motivated to a lot of races. And I think the one race most people talked about was the Four Rangers Ultra. I think that looks incredible. I want to do that. And the funny thing is that when I came back home, my, my girlfriend, she loves to train and, and she loves to running, but she, I mean, she couldn't imagine doing more than a half marathon. And when I came back home, she said to me, I think I want to do the four Rangers ultra. And I think that's, that's like 200 K race. Uh, so I think I am very much inspired to do more of these races. And I think my girlfriend is, and I think some of my friends are as well. So I think, that's that's uh, that's what I love about this. You get so much inspiration from other people to do more of this, uh, and it doesn't ever feel these ultra races. They don't feel very. I mean, they are competitive, but they don't feel very competitive. It's more about getting everyone over the finish line and about the community and camaraderie, and that's what I love. And I want to experience that um, definitely again. Fantastic! Well, I'm really glad to hear it. That's, that's that's heartwarming to hear because obviously I, I come from a place of bias with this, but I, I, we have people on our races who I maybe don't see for two or three years at a time and then they pop up at the spine or at a BTU event or somewhere and you greet them like they're a best friend you haven't seen for a few <laughs> days. You know, it, 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 everyone gels together so tightly on these events and I saw you guys do exactly the same thing. I, I guess it kind of helps when as soon as you cross the finish line, you arrive in a festival tent with a band and a mountain of beer in. Uh, that's the, uh, it's got to make it easier for people to socialize. Absolutely, yeah. 
Well, there you go. We'll we'll try not to disappoint you and make sure there's a party at the end of any race you come along and do for us, pal. But um, Axel, just once again, thank you very much for talking to me today and congratulations once again on, on doing so well in the Highlands. Thank you very much. Fred, how are you? Um, I'm good. Thanks. And no, you? No, it's, I'm very well. Thank you very much. It's good to speak to you again. Um, how was your recovery after the Highland Ultra? What, what, what state were you in when you got home? Um, it, it wasn't too bad. My, my feet were sore. Uh, my, my legs were aching a bit, but no like really damage done. So I just took a, like a week off um, before I started moving again. And then that worked quite well. So now I'm back in full training. Uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me to hear that you got back to training pretty <laughs> quickly. You, you and Axel and Lauren actually all seem to cross the finish line looking fine. Like I, d- I don't remember you and Axel looking stressed at any point. Was were you just putting that on, or were were you feeling comfortable out there? I mean, we we kind of knew where the camera were gonna be, so <laughs> so then we we were going for that to feel like look strong is part of the game. No, but um, I think both like me and and Axel, uh, we were pushing quite hard the whole day, like every day, but still in the state where you're you can still just go for quite a while, um, and then. Even though you're tired, you, you can kind of keep the same pace for for a while, and then, yeah, it, it was still able to to walk in afterwards. Well, that's the perfect place to be. It, it sounds like your your training just lined up perfectly. You, if you're able to be at the front of a race and look that comfortable for that long, then you definitely got something right in training. So, what does training look like for you? Because do you have you know five other big ultra races in your calendar this year is this something you do very regularly um i would so i've i've never considered myself like a uh something like a serious uh ultra runner it's just i just like to run um uh, and then i get a lot of questions like when when's your next race and i'm like, and kind of like uh, i don't know because i haven't planned that much um i kind of just I want to see how my body feels after a race and also my motivation because I find it quite mentally like draining to be racing, preparing for a race. So some years I've, I've kind of had like one or two races and then that was, that was enough. Uh, other times it can be more, but really more than four or four races during a, a season, I would say. Well, part of the reason I ask is you do seem very laid back whenever we've seen you. I, I don't get the impression from you that, you know, you're trying to carve out an ultra running career and get on the podium over and over again. You just seem to sort of absentmindedly work your way up the field. You you just are comfortable in the environment. I, I, I really enjoy watching that. You you and Axel never seemed very competitive, like no. like you were trying to fight each other or fight anybody else. You were just doing your thing out there. I, it, I, I enjoyed watching you guys just have a nice time winning this race. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think you, you summarized it well there. Um, I, I think I like it because I started... Uh, running ultras because I didn't want to do a marathon because in a marathon you have the time you have the competition and everything whilst in in ultra running like no one knows how fast you're supposed to run yeah. if you're doing like a a mountain run everyone's like oh this just it's a long run you don't care about the time um and then also it's it's more like a something personal you're pushing your own limits. Um, and I think for me, that's always been a goal to, to go out in a race and try to have a good time and to push myself. And then if someone runs faster than me, I'm like, cool, they're really fit. Oh, they can run that fast. I've been in some races and you just 
they're sprinting off and it's like wow that's cool to watch but i'm i'm not like i'm not going to try to run that fast um so i think and as you said i've been uh, in uh, for rangers as well i always started the day off quite easy and then i i think i just keep the same pace so the people that has been pushing hard and not being able to finish the whole race, they will. I will just catch them, but I don't think I'll. I really that increase the speed. I just keep that that good pace where I'm in a quite comfort zone. Um, I yeah. agree. Like having yeah. watched your pace out on the Four Angels race, that we got the same impression there. Yeah. Like if you see somebody go past you and they're going really quickly, you're just pleased for them. Yeah. I hope they're yeah. having a good day. Yeah. That was great. Look how fast yeah. they are. And then you get back to running your own race. I think that's a great mindset for an ultra runner because yeah. it's, it's so easy to burn yourself out in the first 10 or 20 kilometers of a stage because it you're is. busy comparing yourself to everybody else. Yeah. You, you're and just genuinely there absorbing the experience. And I like yeah, that. even though I, I have to admit that um, the best part of, of starting slow and then being able to keep that same pace is that feeling of like we talked i talked to i think it was harry strutt i talked yeah. to him about and and um the saying of like taking souls <laughs> <laughs> so so you're saying like i'm just a nice guy but i'm i'm also like i, I it's a quite good feeling the half like the last half of a race to see people and like okay i'm gonna catch you i'm gonna take your soul <laughs> just the, the feeling of being run past well, i <laughs> i painted you there as somebody with this really relaxed philosophy yeah and, and i did and that's that's what we've seen but actually there's a murderous rage <laughs> <in> you fred <laughs> i know <see>. uh, <laughs> i was a bit I, I, I didn't know if I, I should say it but yeah i i'd rather be honest dude that's only yeah. human i yeah. i know exactly the feeling you mean I, i'm not <laughs> I don't do as much running as you guys, but the the two road marathons I ran, yeah. I let everybody overtake me in the first yeah. ten kilometers, and then quietly enjoyed reeling them all back in it, again over the last. It's half a good feeling. Race. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I did my thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I get to overtake you now. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's fine. I don't. I don't think you're actually a murderer. Just, no. just to be clear. <laughs> um. So. Do you have a sort of sporting background? Like you, we we know you as an ultra runner because we've seen you in the Highland, we've seen you in Kenya. Um, but what's your background beyond that? Like, were you very sporty when you were young, and this is just a continuation of that, or are you one of those people that came to ultra running later in your life? Well, where, where are you? Um, I did as a child. I was active my whole. Like growing up, um, mostly it was football, soccer, and then cross country skiing. Uh, I did that quite long and, and it was, it wasn't any like really serious, but still it's a lot of training and, and long hours. So I, I kind of had that growing up that mentality of, of pushing a bit and, and being active. But then I had some years just, I was doing more, um, extreme sports, just trying different stuff, um, from downhill bicycling to climbing to surfing, everything, just testing everything, uh, and didn't have kind of one thing to do. And then I, I picked up ultra running in my mid twenties. Yeah. And then I started there. Yeah, awesome. I I, I find this with, I, I think, especially Norwegian runners. And I haven't got that wrong, have I? You are Norwegian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> I, I try not to mix up my Scandinavians. No, no. Um, but yeah, I've, I've come across this with other Norwegian runners. You see them do incredibly well. And when you start talking to them, they mention cross-country skiing. Like, yeah, because ah. mm. I don't think I've met many fitter people than people who regularly cross country ski. I've got this vague memory of I went to Oslo once a few years ago 
yeah. to do some training on snowshoes. And I went uh, out of the north of the city and around the sort of um, cross-country skiing trails up there yeah. on my snowshoes and just being overtaken by children. <laughs> and, you know, families just out for a day out and they're all looking at me like, what on earth is that guy doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. But it's it's a good grounding. There seem to be, you know, a, a lot of people steered towards outdoor sports when yeah. they're younger in Norway and outdoor sports that really prepare you for being quite physically fit later in life. Yeah. Is that a sweeping statement or would you say no, that's no no i would back that yeah it's there's a saying in norway where you like we were born with our skis on on our feet when we come out come out uh so it's kind of in our backbone and you can as you said like you can just did you take a, a tram or a, something no, up to the no. i was at an airbnb in the center of the city and i just yeah. kept running north until i hit the trails. oh nice yeah yeah because because there's it's it's quite near Oslo, and then you can go skiing from basically from just five minutes of a uh, ride or a little bit longer if you run up. That's that's impressive because it's just uphill from. Down, I used down. to be fit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe now, Fred. But yeah, I did. I, I used to be fit enough to do that sort of thing. But no, um, I can I can see that. Yeah, well, thank you. Don't get me wrong. I noticed that there were tram stops once I got yeah, there, and yeah. I could have just got there by other <laughs> means. But you know, it's part of the training, right? Yeah, to, exactly. To, to see that oh, I can take the tram, but I will not. I will yeah. run. Yeah, that's what I like to tell myself, anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So, why the Highland Ultra? What What made you want to come and do the Highland race? Um, it was. Quite, it was just after the four rangers uh i figured i want to do one more race with you guys um and then that was the first or no it was the the ice but um i don't know i there's enough ice up here the rest of <laughs> so I'm, you've seen I'm snow more, yeah. yeah and i kind of more like looking forward to run around in shorts so um it just it looked really spectacular the scenery um it's similar to to norwegian on the west side but still different and i've, I've hiked uh, the west island way in um ah, wonderful say like 10 years ago and I, I really enjoy that so i kind of thought oh this is going to be great something similar but even more remote and with a like with a good uh, great crew to, so I, I knew that the experience was going to be well organized and everything. Oh well, it's it's nice to hear you say that. But yeah. I, so, what did you think of Noidart when you finally saw it in person? I I love it. It's like passing yeah. into another world. Yeah, it was. It was so cool coming in with a ferry, and you just ah, you can just turn off your phone. It won't help you, and then you're all there um yeah i like that kind of community where they just figure out a way to live and everyone's like okay let's do this and it it's a part of it i mean it, it would be easy to go up to noidart and have an amazing time because the scenery is is wonderful if there was yeah. no community there it would yeah. still be a beautiful place to go and, and you'd have a wonderful time but the community really adds something. It's it is such a positive thing to see how well they're all working together to, yeah, to yeah. look after each other there. Yeah, really. Yeah. Well, we, we kind of hope that a little bit of that is instilled in the runners when when we bring you there. You know, do it's a similar sort of thing. We we bring groups of people together, and you have yeah. to look after each other out. Yeah, in that that's environment. true. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean what were your favorite parts of the course and that's that's got to be difficult to answer because there's there's a lot of good stuff but what what were your highlights um i think each day w was was a bit different so i can't, I, I liked them the, um it was a bit varied between them uh the first day was quite fast the first uh, section yeah um and also i i just so so yeah it was a good day out and you had that 
um, as, as, as I said, you can go quite fast, get some some kilometers back quite early in the day and feel because because in the start it can be a bit overwhelming when it's a long race and you you have run five kilometers and it's like oh it's a long way to go to the finish line but in this race you could do 20 25 like easy can can't say easy but mm -hmm. <laughs> easier than expected um and then the, I think the finish of day one, the coastal trail, I, I really like that one. Really? Yeah, because we passed the last guy there, so we got a <laughs> we got that like extra motivation. I think that's why. Yeah, uh, you got the final then, soul. Yeah, yeah, the final soul, and then a little bit of energy boost there. Um, but also just because you never know, you don't know how how long it will continue. And even though that it's a bit like frustrating, it's I, I like that feeling as well, because then you really have to work on that mental just one one more step, one more step. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I if if people are going to complain about any part of the course, it's usually yeah. that bit. Because yeah. they they get to the side of that lock and they think, oh, just a few kilometers now. Yeah. And it's all along the side of the lock, so it must be pretty level. This yeah. will be easy. It was not. And yeah. it's not yeah. at all. It's either straight up or straight <laughs> down. And when it's up, it's difficult. And yeah. when it's down, it's boggy. And that lock is very long. <laughs> yeah, it was. And it but is. It, it, it's, it's mentally yeah. tough, that section. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that usually has people complaining, but I I like this. This is what you came for. You you know this is a test of your mental resilience, and yeah. and this is a part of it, right? Yeah, and I think I think I said to Axel during that like trail run, like now is the time to just keep on grinding because everyone is a bit more tired than us. So let's just push, and that's yeah. I, I like that kind of state to be in. No, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Now, well, now you did really well. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed that part of the course. Yeah. As hard as it is, it's beautiful down there. And, yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you kind of see, like, you know, you're you're closing in because you can't go forever. Yeah, it's, it's going to get there. Yeah. You start to see the mountains on either side of the lot yeah. close in, and you yeah. know that means you must yeah. be getting near that camp <laughs> at the end of the water. Yeah, no, amazing. Um, and uh, what would you say the hardest part of the course was? Where what did you find most difficult? Um, I mean, day two was definitely the hardest day. Uh, you know that when you when you get like the most pain you have is on your top of your of your foot because you've been. You're kind of dragging your shoe out of the mud. Oh yeah. And then you have like that soreness in the muscles and you know it's not a it's not a runnable area you're you're in. Um and it was was really wet that day. It was like everything it was it was a hard day out. Um but still it was it was uh, I, I really liked the marking of it um and taking us i that uh, yeah I, I might i mean maybe a little bit weird that way but when i see a trail and then the flags are going the opposite way into like some stones or just a mud hole it makes me a bit happy because i like it's just funny to do it that way Chris um, will be very happy to hear yeah. that because I, th I think Chris and Nick Watson, who has more to do with setting this course, and John Shield, yeah. who actually John goes Shield, out yeah. and marks, they are all people of the same mind as you. Yeah, uh, We could take that trail, yep. but this looks fun. Yeah, <laughs> So let's do that instead. Yeah, and, and that they had a lot of kind of that way. It was, you were going straight forward and then, oh, it's a, like a rocky area. It doesn't look good oh yeah we're going up there mm, okay <laughs> yeah. makes yeah. it interesting though yeah and that's the yeah. idea and it, yeah. you know part of it is we want you to see places that you'd be unlikely to see so yeah. it, it, 
even if we have a few runners that might have hiked through that area before, yeah. we're going to take the race at least partly <laughs> on routes that you wouldn't have done because you'd yeah. have looked at them as a hiker and thought, no, that's crazy. I'm not going that way. That's the way we're going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every time. Ah, well, yep. I'm glad you enjoyed that because yeah. sometimes it, it's seen as an act of cruelty, but we really are just trying to make things more fun. Yeah. You, I think you, you nailed it. So uh, in terms of training, I just wanted to come back to that a little bit because some yep. people will be listening to this because they're thinking of doing the Highland Ultra next year or maybe mm -hmm. they've already signed up or yep. maybe they've just signed up to a, a similarly hilly race. Um, what do you think prepared you well in your training? Because you didn't, it's very tough terrain. It is very muddy in places. It is very steep and rocky. It's it's not an easy course to run. And you no. made it look easy in a lot of ways. So <laughs> what what had worked well in your training that, that helped you out when you got there? Mm, I think some of it I, I'm I'm quite used to running on trails. I th I think that's I've I've been running with other people as well, and they're way better runners like than me. But when they go on a trail, if they're just like they just go on flat, it's something completely different. It's how you like you have to be quicker on your feet and not having that same rhythm so i would say that probably is an advantage um but then training wise before coming here i did a lot of uh, intervals on like quite steep uh, treadmill very good so, so i did that it's quite normal uh four or five by uh, four minutes six minutes of intervals in a 10% uh, incline where you're going quite hard, but you're running. Yeah. Or if you're not running, you can just, you can walk upwards and your heart will be, heart rate will be high, even though mm, I think that was, that's probably the best tip to, to say to people, like get used to going uphill. And on some easier days, I did uh, Stairmaster as well. Yeah. Um, so a little way more hill training than uh, other times, um, but also running downhill. I think a lot of people forget that if you're starting at one place and you're going a lot of uphill and you're going to have the camp at the same place, you have to go downhill every meter as well. and especially in running, that's, I, th I find that harder to run downhill. Agreed. I, it's easy to think the downhill is going to be the easy bit. No. Like, I don't need to worry about that. Yeah. It's not the case. Going no, downhill no, no, at speed is a skill. Yep. And it's also the, like, it's going to crush your feet if you go too hard yeah. and you're not used to it. So I, I would recommend to go find a hill. Uh, we have some ski hills here in uh, in Norway, quite near to in Oslo. So I went there and I just ran up and down. I know where you mean. I looked yeah. at that when I went to Oslo and I yeah. bottled it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about going and then I thought, no, that looks insane. Yeah. But you, you've done that. Yeah. Because it, it's kind of like hiking up a mountain, but you just, you can go up and down a lot. <laughs> so, uh Yeah. That's a good uh, tip, I think. No, agreed. Uh, yeah. I, it, it sounds obvious, <laughs> it's, but do it, not underestimate not, the hills on this race. Yeah, it's not fun though. That training, it's no. it's for like people that's really interested in running. I would say. No, I hear you, but that's yeah. that's part of what these races are, isn't it? You yeah. can make that three days of the race yeah. much more enjoyable if yeah. you've done the hard work in the weeks and months beforehand and yep. yeah that's that's what we're talking about here do the do the boring tough bit while you're in training yeah. and you're just listening to a podcast or watching something on your screen and and then you'll be in a good state to enjoy those hills when you Absolutely. get to the race yeah yeah no, totally i agree, agree. Yeah, excellent and mm -hmm. look uh, there's there's a little bit more to the the highland ultra than than just the the running and stuff like that i mean i know 
on the last day you get to come in you cross that finish line and there's a party just after the finish line which yeah i thought was very nice of chris to put together i mean how was that because it was lovely just seeing all of you guys wait for each other to cross the line and and congratulate yeah. each other and then just go straight into everyone just wants to hear how everybody else's race was and i i really enjoyed seeing that was that was that a fun night for you guys as well absolutely yeah it was great great uh, like post race party um with good food good drinks and yeah as you said it's everyone has been running the same course but they have had a different day absolutely so and everyone is proud so it's fun to as you they, i really like that when everyone is going to the same place and you can kind of just greet in everyone that comes and as you come if you come a bit later that's the best tip come i, I wouldn't recommend to come like early because then there's no one there to cheer for you <laughs> uh but but then as more and more people come in the crowd will just get bigger and you have that bigger and bigger applause um Absolutely. If you want the biggest party at the finish line, yeah. come, come in last. Yeah. You know? If you want to win the race, build yeah. a big enough gap <laughs> on the first two days and then you can come in late on day three. Ooh, we yeah. should have thought about that. Oh, sorry, man. Yeah. I should have said that beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, very, very cool. No, it, I, I really enjoy that. I love to see a finish line anyway, but if somebody's yeah. going to stick a band and a little pop-up restaurant yeah. and a stack of beer at the finish line, then oh, yeah. that's a winner for me. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, uh, again, we're thinking about tips for anyone that's thinking of signing up to this in the future. Is there any sort of piece of equipment that really worked for you or that you wished you'd brought with you? Like, what, what should people be thinking of in terms of kit? Um, I would say... The thing that really was a, maybe even it was even colder than I expected it to be, and that's coming um, from a Norwegian people. Yeah, yeah. So, so bring enough clothes. That would be my best tip. And sleeping bag. Don't be if you feel like this might be too cold. It is too cold. And then, if you don't get that sleep during the night, you're it's not going to be a pleasant pleasant race so i think that'll be the what was i i like i thought it was going to be a bit warmer but it wasn't yeah it's easy and, to think the uk is not the arctic you know yeah, how cold yeah. can it possibly be at the end of april yeah that's mm -hmm. that's springtime yeah no cold really yep. very cold <laughs> yeah <laughs> down by the side of that lock at kinlock horn as well yeah that valley channels all the wind straight yep. down over the water so yeah yeah always going to be chilly there mm -hmm. no um well look i'm i'm not gonna keep you any longer um you've got a day to get on with um so i just wanted to say congratulations again that was an incredible performance um, thank you so much also congratulations on having been the person of whom i took probably I, I don't know if it's the best photo I took on the trip, but it's certainly the one that the most people have asked me for copies of. Uh, maybe for the benefit of the people on YouTube, I'll put this up on the screen as we have this little moment. But as you yeah. sort of did your Daniel Craig, James Bond step out of that freezing cold lock at the finish line. <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised how many people have asked me for a copy of that photo. So. It's going to be a calendar, isn't it? Um, yeah, I'll yeah. I'll get a poster sized version of it printed out yeah. and get it sent over <laughs> to you, like you know, maybe a cardboard cut out version. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, that yeah, was. I, I would recommend everyone to take a take a swim after the race. Uh, maybe when you're not around to, to make it. Uh, yeah, that it did start a bit of an ethical debate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we take the photo of him or not? Well, he looks yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, but he's only wearing swimming trunks. Like, is that okay? And then we come to the conclusion that, well, no, we'll take the photo and then we'll show him. And if he likes it, that's fine. Yeah. And then Lauren got in and then it's like, well, now I don't feel like I should be taking this photo. So is this yeah. okay or not? And then, <laughs> Yeah, it, it started a whole thing. And that's, that's good. We should yeah. be talking about these things. 
do I get some money for for that if people buy it? Will I get some no, some money? Uh, just the uh, happiness of knowing how okay, happy yeah. that photo has made so many people. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if other people start buying it, absolutely, I'll cut you in on the royalties. <laughs> I'm glad to hear. Amazing. Well, look, on that note, um, congratulations again, Fred. And I, I, I hope we see you somewhere else amazing soon. Definitely. Yeah, I will, I will, I'll be there for another one. Amazing. And I, I, I really recommend people going as well. It's uh, so far, I think it's the best cry like crew and the logistics, everything runs so smoothly. So uh, well done to you guys as well. Oh, and always happy. That's that's the I really like as well. You're always smiling, everyone. We couldn't do what we do if we didn't love doing it. No, that's true. Yeah, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't go without that much sleep and be that stressed if if we didn't love doing what we do. So thank <laughs> you for that. I appreciate it. But yeah, on that All note, right. then I'll see you again soon, buddy. See Bye. ya. Bye. Good afternoon then, Lauren Gregory. Lauren, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Hi, Will. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Ah, no good. worries. Thanks for taking the time. I, it, look, it, usually I'd jump straight into an episode like this being like, so have you recovered from your, your adventure in Scotland? But you've had another adventure in between that and now, haven't you? you? I did, yeah. Well, I, I, my race planning wasn't all that good this year. I, I saw Highlands booked it and I saw UTS 50 booked it without even looking how close they were. <laughs> Turns out they were two weeks apart. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I've just put in a shift in Snowdonia doing the UTS 55K two weeks post Highland Ultra. So um, it, it was very much a case of just getting it done and sort of uh, battling through. It was it was quite hot. So um, the heat added to the experience as well. But yeah, it was much, very much a case of just completing it rather than competing in it. Well, it sort of not wanting to dig into a race that maybe didn't entirely go to what you had in mind, but I, I think it's interesting to people to hear how, you know, recovery between events close together and stuff can can work. So I'm going to go way off script and dive into that slightly, if you don't mind, sort of yeah. with that short gap between the two, mm. how did you feel going into it? Because i I got to say, I saw you cross the line at the Highland Ultra and you looked fine. You no. like <laughs> unfazed. I'm quite good at internalizing pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, Useful in ultra running. <laughs> yeah, they poke a face at times. Um, so I'd, I, I've got a running coach, uh, Steve Hopwood, uh, and we'd sort of already had a chat pre Highland and agreed that the the, the time between Highland and UTS would be very much um, just, you know, downtime, recovery, focusing on getting some good kind of restorative sleep and eating well and just kind of keeping my legs ticking over. There was no need to kind of put in any big efforts. Um, so, yeah, coming out of Highland, actually, it felt really good coming out of Highland's Ultra. It's probably the best I've ever felt post race um given that you know i gave it a really good push i wanted to do well i trained really hard for it um when it came to race week i you know i really did give it my all it was it was you know a huge focus for me so to come out feeling pretty good i mean my legs were really good the next day like you know why they were a bit heavy and a bit stiff but there was no pains as such no injuries which is quite rare for me i'm a little bit prone to not injury but i've got arthritic feet so quite often they'll kind of get really inflamed and a bit angry for a few days um, so they were all fine, but yeah, so it, it it was really good. I was able to sort of come out of Highland feeling all right, just a bit tired, um, and go straight into sort of recovery stroke taper. The only thing I did really suffer with was um, had like really weird night sweats for about a week after Highland Dolce, and I've had them before, um, maybe for like one or two nights, and then it settled, but. I just could I just had this like uncontrollable <laughs> sort of like night sweats, um, which I think possibly took their toll going into UTS 50 because I don't know whether I sort of lost some salts. Well, I would have definitely lost some sort of salts and, and minerals and things, but I didn't really think to replace them. I thought just by hydrating lots, that was enough. But coming into UTS 50, I ended up having all sorts of weird cramps and just stuff that my body's never done before. And I'm pretty certain there's a there's a correlation there between the two. So, um, yeah, so I, I sort of went into UTS feeling pretty good, really. 
given it was only two weeks out of Highland. Yeah, well, I, I, it's strange, isn't it? The the recovery from uh, something as physically intense as, as something like the Highland Ultra is a difficult thing and a little unpredictable. Um, I've really steered us way off course here, but there you go. <laughs> I, and I've heard that before. I don't know if anyone out there is listening to this and has a physiological explanation for these night sweats and stuff like that after an event. I, I know it's years back now, but when I did the Ice Ultra, that was a five-day event. And I had sort of seven to ten days afterwards of feeling like I needed to change the sheets every hour or so. It, oh, it's it as really well. weird. Yeah, yeah, it is a really... I mean, I've spoken to a couple of people who I know have had it as well, and there's different theories, of, you know, sort of retention. I had sort of quite swollen. I actually forgot to mention that. My feet and ankles were really swollen for a couple of days, so there was obviously some sort of retention there. So whether it was that kind of dispersing or also my body... I was just so cold at Highlands Ultra. Like, when I wasn't running, I was just continuously cold and shivering. So I wondered if my body was doing some weird kind of readjustment back to... To sort of normal temperatures, but um, yeah, it's hard to know really. It's probably not just one thing. I imagine it's a combination of things. But yeah, I'd be very interested to know the, the physiological explanation behind it. Yeah, like answers on a postcard if anyone out there has them. Yeah. Uh, if any of our regular race medics are jumping up and down listening to this because they know exactly what's going on, hit me, find me, and I will feed that information back to Lauren. Um, <laughs> But let's let's loop back. I'm 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 great at veering off topic. I'll try and steer us back a little I bit if I can. Yeah. Oh well, <laughs> God! If neither of us are at the wheel on this, Lauren, this could go anywhere. Uh, so, uh, Lauren Gregory, you know you are a PT and running coach. You've been doing this for quite a while now. Um, how long have you been doing this? How long has this been your day to day? Oh, it's so long. Um, mm -hmm. 2001, I started um, as a personal trainer, well, fitness instructor, and then I sort of progressed to um, personal trainer over the, the years after that. Um, so yeah, quite, quite a long time now. What are we in? 2023, so 22 years, something like that. Um, I did come out of it for a while because I'm also qualified as a graphic designer. Um, and I was, when I sort of started as a fitness instructor, I was working in health club um and i kind of worked my way up to management but then kept sidestepping so i came out of the industry for a short while just to kind of figure out where i actually wanted to take my life turns out i do really love fitness and helping people so came back into it but by which point i got married and had kids so i needed it to be a little bit more civilized on sort of the hours that i was working so i went freelance with it instead um and I'm a mobile PT, so I've, I've got a really nice um, way that I work that I go to people's houses and I have a car full of equipment and I'll set up in their living room or their garden and then we do the session and then I leave and they can carry on with their day. Um, so that yeah. sounds awesome. It's a really nice job. <laughs> I love it. Apart from the freezing cold winter when it's not so nice. But. Well, no, I imagine. But <laughs> well, yeah, we have established, and I guess we'll come back to that, that you're not a massive fan of the cold. Um, I'm not in the cold, no. I'm, I'm half Mexican, so I've definitely got warm blood. <laughs> I do really well in the heat, not so much in the cold. <laughs> so... It what about the ultra running then? Like I, I'm, I'm well aware that the Highland Ultra isn't your only foray into the ultra running world. Um, what, what sort of events are you into running, and how did you get to that point? And you know, we'll have people listening to this podcast who are very much not ultra runners, and I remember clearly enough not being involved in the scene that anything above sort of half marathon level just sounds implausible for a human yeah. being to run so how did you break that barrier um yeah i mean i, I always ran in school and probably like most people to be a bit cross country and stuff i actually really hated running when i was in school so god knows how i've ended up doing what i, what I do now but um i could be sort of going into my sort of 20s 30s i i was very much like you just said like just sort of 10Ks, I did the occasional half marathon. And then I got involved with the fundraiser with a, a boy in America who we were trying to raise funds for to so his mum could uh, buy a wheelchair van uh, for Braden. Um, and so me and a couple of friends did the race to the Stones as my first ultra marathon. We did it over two days. I didn't even know what an ultra marathon was actually when my friend suggested it. Um, I had to Google it. <laughs> At which point I just didn't really talk to him for about three days because I was like, I don't think this is for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but we ended up doing it. We raised a bit, I think about, I think it was about two and a half, three thousand pounds in the end. Um, and it was very much meant to be just that as a one off. Um, but then as I discovered, I think probably this happens to most ultra runners, you, that sort of 
part you sort of come out the other side of it you've probably been through a few sort of pain barriers in the process and you suddenly realize that you're capable of more than you really thought you were so then I really wanted to explore that side so um so yeah then I sort of kept signing up to I just did like a couple of year for the first couple of years and then um sort of started to get more bit more adventurous did a hundred miler and then I put in a, a gin fuels ballot entry to the CCC and I actually happened to get in <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I, you know, I was like two weeks later, got the email. I was like, oh man, I forgot I'd done that. Um, so then that was like my really big kind of experience of a proper sort of mountain ultra marathon, um, massively out of my depth. Got a coach on board, trained really hard because I'm very much all or nothing. Like if I decide to see something, I'll throw myself at it. And that's what I did with CCC. Um, and then again, so it just kind of spiraled like that. And then before I knew it, I found myself on the start line of the Marathon de Saab in the Sahara Desert um, back in 2021. So I, I do really love the multi-day format. I, I think probably it suits my body better as well, just kind of having, like I, I'm happy to put in a long shift and I don't mind if it's, it's, it's grueling, um, but it's quite nice stopping, recovering and then doing it all again. I quite like that sort of that hard graft. Um, I can imagine with 20 years as a PT under your belt as well, you've built up a lot of resilience, you know, that it, and th yeah. th that would lend itself to a multi-day, that getting a kicking day after day and bouncing back from it. Yeah, very much. I mean, my, my job is I, you know, I'm a, I'm a PT. I don't necessarily always exercise with my clients during their session. I'll demonstrate exercises, but it's not my exercise session, it's theirs. Um, but I also teach classes um, three times a week, which I do take part because they're online classes. So obviously they need to be able to see me and what they're meant to be doing. Um, and, you know, sometimes you sort of wake up and just think, my God, I haven't got the energy today. And, um, but you've got to get, you know, got, you've got to do it. You got to, it's almost like performing, you know, I sort of log on to sort of dial into Zoom and it's like flicking a switch. I'm like, morning. <laughs> Even then inside, I'm like, you know, dying a little bit because I'm so tired. Uh, so that's very, I think that served me quite well with these multi days as well. You can, you know, you never get a great sleep with these things. Um, and you sort of wake up thinking, God, how am I going to put it off today? But you somehow managed to find it. So yeah, I, I really like that, that sort of grittiness about it. And, you know, at Highland Dolch, I hardly got any sleep at all, especially that first, well, the second night we were in camp two, it was so damp and cold and everything was wet. And um, I think I got about four hours sleep that night. And I remember waking up just thinking, God, we got sort of was well, effectively the long day. Um, and it took a while to get going, I have to say. The first couple of hours were pretty miserable, but then it suddenly kicks in, doesn't it? There's, you sort of always find it from somewhere. Yeah, your legs remember what they're here for and, and yeah. things start lining up again. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I so what sort of event do you favor? Is there is the Highland Ultra sort of typical of the type of event you like to put yourself into or, or, or is there that kind of specific thing for you? Um, I don't know if I've got a favorite search just because every time I do an event, I'll come out and go, that was amazing. That's the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> and then I'll do something completely different and say the same thing about it. Um, but yeah, I think definitely multi-day works for me. I love the mountains. Um, for me, sort of the higher, the bigger, the better. My, my idea of sort of the like hellish race would be something like the Grand Union Canal, just for me personally. And I, I don't know how people do it. I've got so much respect for people who run 145 miles on flat canal. I just, I like being up high and, and I quite like having, you know, so it, it's a difficult one, but yeah, I, I think definitely sort of mountain stuff, multi-day stuff really works for me. Um, I also just really love the sense of community that comes with more so with multi-days. Having said that, UTS 50 with, you know, being a one stage event, it, 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 we had such a great time. There were so many people there that we saw, it was like a massive Instagram party <laughs> when I got to registration. There was like so many people there that I sort of followed and got to meet for the first time and chat. So yeah, I, I think every event's unique and it, each comes with its, um, you, you know, with a, a different, different aspect, which, you know, you come out and it's, um, you sort of take it away with you and, and have those memories of it. So. Yeah, I mean, by the end of even something like the Highland Ultra, a three-day event, you know the names of most people around camp. Yeah. And if you don't know their names, you've, you've probably chatted to them a couple of times. Yeah. And you do. You you care about each other. Yeah. I know I read a bit in your blog yeah. where you were talking about 
the amount of people who'd hung around at Kinloch Horn to see people in at the end of stage one. And it, it, it that sort of stuff always gets me because I've, mm-hmm. I've got used to seeing that level of camaraderie on site, but it's cold. You've just run a long way. Like what you need more than anything else in the world now is probably warmth and recovery. Yeah. But you'll go out because you're emotionally invested. You'll go out yeah. and you'll cheer the other people yeah, in because so they need right. that support and too. And that's the sort of thing I really loved about it. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. We were all sort of huddled around with our foil blankets wrapped around each other, sort of trying to keep warm. And a couple of us used our um, the bottles that we were given, filled with hot water, made like hot water bottles. We were sort of hugging up. Brilliant. <laughs> just sort of ways and means to kind of stay warm. But yeah, absolutely. Like it was just really lovely that sense of, of camaraderie and that community all huddling around um, and then everyone, you know, every now and again, someone would, would come in and cross the finish line and we'd all kind of give them a bit of a cheer and, you know, the group would grow. It was quite nice. I think I remember that day, I think it was the, the stage two, obviously sort of it was quite a longer, really tough day um, and quite a few people coming in quite late. And I remember it was starting to get dark and I really wanted to just kind of go to sleep, you know, just like so tired, but at the same time, like it, where there was still a couple of people out and the moment they were in, I was like, right, everyone's safe let's all and everyone just dispersed and went to bed but it was really nice that everyone really hung in there for the last person to cross the line it's it's a really special sort of sense of, of community really that grows very quickly like you say you suddenly care about people that 24 hour uh, 24 hours early you would never even met before yeah i love that you know that on paper the best thing for your body right now is to recover and concentrate yeah. on that above anything else because you've got two more days on the trail to do but you can't you can't go to bed until you're sure everyone's no made it no you, t- you just get it's horrible fomo as well i think there was i think the first night i did go to bed quite early and i could hear everyone chatting and laughing i was like what am i missing out on <laughs> like, i want to go back out there <laughs> love it yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, not an entirely new environment to you then heading out into the uh, the hills around the West Highlands. Um, I, how did you find it? Well, firstly, I guess, what made you choose the Highland Ultra? Um, hmm. But then what were your expectations coming in and what were you faced with when you got there? Um, so I heard about the Highland Ultra just actually last year. Um because I'm friends with John Shields, who was marking the course. Uh, and I remember sort of seeing his stories last year on Instagram. You had a really sunny year, didn't you, last year? So I was like, oh, God, this place looks amazing. I mean, I was under no illusion that that's not normal Scottish weather. When I signed up, I, I sort of figured that the chances of getting that two years running was slim to none. Having said that, our weather wasn't awful. I think it could have been a lot worse. Having Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It was one year, it was just like biblical. Um, so yeah, so I, but also I'd, I'd also previously been to the Isle of Skye on a family holiday, uh, and whilst I didn't get too much running there, I did sort of manage to get in a run one day, and I was like, gosh, this place is just wild and and amazing, like so beautiful and, and rugged. I love that. So I think that was the year before. No, it's the year of COVID. Actually, it was twenty twenty. Um, so with those two things in mind, I was like, right, this might actually be a really good race to enter. So yeah, I, I entered it last year. And, um, yeah, and then found myself out there this year. So, um, and it, it completely exceeded my expectations as well. I didn't really, I try not to go into things without any expectation because I don't, you know, then you sort of set yourself up for disappointment. If it, you know, if you sort of paint a picture of something yeah. that way and it doesn't turn out to be that way. So I just knew that it was going to be wild and it was going to be hard. It was going to be boggy. I was warned about the bogs. <laughs> as it happened, the bogs were way more. <laughs> than I expected. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I know. Well, it's quite fun, actually. I mean, I remember on day one sort of crossing a boggy field and all of a sudden my right leg disappeared beneath me and the left one kept going and I found myself in like a split position in this bog with no one around. I was like, I can't even get out because there's nothing to push myself down on. So I'm not really sure how I managed to get out of it. But yeah, I remember thinking right now we are definitely in bogland. Um, but yeah. I didn't know we came that close to losing a runner to quicksand. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. slightly alarming what you're yeah, describing. I mean, I was it? literally like thigh deep in it. There was part of me that was slightly panicked by it, but luckily it was, it was just bog and not, not sand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, we do try and get that across to people. It, it, all these beautiful photos we take out in the Highland, it's the mountains that you focus on, but yeah. in between the mountains, there's a, a lot of mud. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's a lot of tough terrain. I mean, it is, Very. you know, I think, I think it's important that people sort of know what they're signing up to, or at least have an idea of it. I think there's also an element of surprise that should be kept. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely it, the terrain was a lot harder than I expected it. And I, I expected it to be quite hard, but it was much harder. What was particularly difficult about it? I know we've talked about the sort of boggy nature of it, but what about the climbs that are involved in that sort of thing? Yeah, well, the, the climb, I mean, I, I love a good climb, actually, um, mainly because you're always rewarded with, with beautiful views at the top. Um, but also I quite like that that sort of gritty, hard graphs. I know people hate it, but that's almost the part of ultras that I really like. Um, so, but yeah, so I'm just trying to remember some of them actually. Um, there was that first one, Man Barrowsdale, day one and three. We went up at either side, didn't we? That that was okay. Um, but it was on day two, the sort of the first big climb that we were sent up. The first bit wasn't too bad because it was quite sort of light trail, sort of just slightly rocky, but it was quite steep. But then it carried on into bog. So you were, it was really steep and boggy. So not only you sort of like, you know, having to put in a bit of a bit of a shift to get up this sort of steep mountain, it's also boggy. So you're also losing your feet beneath you. And it was just energy zapping. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it just took me a while to get going that day. And I just remember being mentally in quite a bad place, just thinking like, this is so soon in the day to feel so exhausted. Um, and it's only going to get worse. But I had to have a word with myself that day. And I've sort of basically said that if you carry on like this, it's going to be a really long day. So just <laughs> pull it together and stop moaning. <laughs> so, okay. uh, this is where some of that resilience comes into play, didn't it, that we talked about before? Like it, it, when, when we say the word resilience, it doesn't just encapsulate physical things. It's, it's being able to withstand those moments where you yeah. slept badly and this is much harder than I expected and I'm now thigh deep in a bog. Yeah. <laughs> and like exactly. to, to and pick yourself up and yeah. not let that ruin your day. Um, I mean, I always tell myself, like, this is what I signed up to. I wouldn't want it to be easy. You know, I, for me, that's the appeal of doing some of these events um, is I, I want it to be hard. I want to have to work for my medal. Um, and when I get to the finish line, I want to feel utterly exhausted. Um, so, you know, I say that now, sat comfortably at my kitchen table, but, and at the time I'm probably sort of, you know, internalizing a lot of swear words and well, we're not even internalizing it. There's no one around. <laughs> There was many swear words shouted out that day. <laughs> we look around, no one's around, are they? Um, One of the advantages of being in a remote location. Yep. Can you get public <laughs> catharsis. No problem. Crack <laughs> yeah, on. That's it. That's it. But, um, yeah. So I, I, I do really love that about um, some of these events. It's just getting down to the sort of the nitty gritty of it all. Well, it, I've managed to get this far without saying the word congratulations, which I realize now is almost a criminal offense, but we, <laughs> we have sort of reached that point in the narrative now where you did incredibly well at this race. Like you. you've, you've come away from the Highland Ultra as a winner. Uh, was that part of the plan? I mean, what were your expectations of your um, performance as you went in? I, so, well, thank you. First of all, um, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really big focus for me, the Highlands Ultra. I, I did, I trained really hard for it. I wanted to do well at it. Um, I, I, I'd hoped for a podium finish, but if I'm entirely honest, like I, I was trying to manage my expectations. Like I work with a lady called Dawn, who's like a mindset coach. So we always, so I have like my running coach and I've got my mindset coach <laughs> um, and she's brilliant. So we always kind of manage goals and manage expectations together. Um, and, you know, she said to me, what is your goal for this? And I didn't say anything. I just looked at her and she went, you're all trying to win it, aren't you? <laughs> and I was like, well, that would be nice. But also I realized that might not happen. Therefore, I need to have another goal so that I'm not disappointed that doesn't happen. So yeah, I, I did set myself out for, for a pretty high goal on this one, pretty high target, um, which, you know, again, was quite a hard fought one because I had um, Susie, second lady, she was constantly nipping at my heels. Like she, she's so strong on the climbs and she, she got me on the third day. Yeah. <laughs> and I, it, we, I was like, no. <laughs> She's just so, so strong on the climbs. Um, so, but we work quite well together as well. Like, you know, there was never any, because loads of people were like, well, there's a, was there rivalry? I was like, not at all. Like, no, we, you know, we hugged it out at the end. It was just good, healthy competition. And again, I wouldn't have wanted it to be easy. 
Yeah. <laughs> and it, that was great at the finish line. You you two were fantastic. Like you picked yourself up off the floor straight away so you could be stood there clapping for her as she came in. But I, I was surprised. Like we, I'd seen you on the tracker. You'd done incredibly well the first couple of days. Mm-hmm. When you came in towards the finish line on the last day and were looking back over your shoulder, I was like, who's she looking for? There's not going to be anyone there. And there was. <laughs> yeah. She, and, and to be honest, that gap between us, I think it was less than a minute. That was the longest gap they'd been all day. Wow. And I could you know, she was constantly, and she's got these, um, she was using poles. So I could just hear her poles clicking behind me <laughs> the whole time. At one point I went to go and put some music on. I was like, actually, no, that's probably not a good idea. Cause I won't be able to hear her poles if she suddenly comes up and then sort of goes past me. But um, yeah, I mean, she, she, you know, she was really strong. She just got stronger as the race went on actually. <laughs> Uh, Because even on day one, we were sort of chatting at the end and she said, um, she said her downhills aren't very good. She said she's not very confident. And I'm like, well, actually, my downhills are quite good. So I sort of noted that, you know, this is where our competition is going to be. As it happened on day three, when we reached the top of Mount Barrasdale, she'd already taken the lead. She was just in front of me. And in my mind, I was like, right, I just got to put in a shift and and get back the lead. Um, and I sort of almost took for granted at that point that I was automatically going to get it just because I was like, well, my downhills are strong, hers aren't. She'd got, she'd, she'd literally developed skills over three days. <laughs> <laughs> and like that last day, it all came into fruition. I was like, oh my God, she's literally, she's just not letting up. But it was great. You know, it was, we really did sort of battle it out. And then um, just in that last section coming onto the road, um, I sort of just gave it one final push. But yeah, I mean, less than a minute between us, I think. On, on the stage, I think overall there was like 20 minutes. But, um, yeah, something like that. But yeah, on, uh, I I get what you mean. On that day, she was yeah. very very strong. Yes, but, yeah, yeah. And she looked so poker face as well. There's a great picture that I think um, Jack took of me doing that very last section on the track. And my face, you can see I'm fully focused and not, you know, I've actually got my headphones in my hand because that's where I gave up on them. I was like, I just can't get them, get them out. <laughs> and you can see her behind me and she looks completely chilled about it she's just taking a stride and i'm like oh my god wow. <laughs> it's a really funny picture <laughs> yeah, outstanding performance i so i mean were there any times where you did feel stressed during this race because from my point of view anytime i saw you you looked like you'd maybe just knocked off a, hot, a park run you know? <laughs> really? um, is that poker um, face again yeah. uh, everyone always says that when i <laughs> when i bring this up uh, but it, were there any times when you were out there and thinking oh my god this this um, might be a bit much no there wasn't actually and i, I honestly mean that um the, the most stressful bit was that that last descent coming off man Barazel, um because it was well no before actually going up because she she was in front um that that was quite stressful but um but no other than that no I, I felt really at home out there actually I felt really comfortable I didn't really have any nerves as such like I always have a little bit of anxiety I think that's a good thing I think if you're still on the start line com- feeling completely casual then you perhaps going in slightly for me anyway that you know I, I would want just a little bit of nerves because you know at the very least you should be respecting the playground that you're about to enter and that you know even if your competitors aren't a threat the environment could be so it's important to um consider that but um yeah no I, I just I loved all of it really I felt really prepared for it I knew I'd put the training in um you know I had all my kits I'd sort of spent so much time trying to get my weight down in my pack um to sort of obsess over the the weight on that um yeah i i didn't really feel stressed at any point just that last hour or so it was very stressful more than made up for the lack of stress on the previous two days stages <laughs> well there you go you weren't faking it you genuinely were feeling that strong all the way through that's that's great that just, just speaks really to having prepared it. well yeah i did just really enjoyed it um, I just enjoyed the the terrain, the, the backdrop, um, you know, the team. It was always really nice to sort of see whoever was at the checkpoints because um, that's the thing. It's so it, it's a small field and it's so such a remote, rugged place. You know, there were times there was literally no one around. I remember there's one day on stage two when we were sort of going through like the mountain pass. And I didn't see anyone for about two hours and I kept looking behind me and I was like, and I could see that I was going in the right direction because the flags were there. Um, 
but it's really weird. So when you do come across someone, it's, it's quite nice. It sort of just reminds you that you're not completely alone out there. But. <laughs> Do you enjoy that time alone as well, though? Because I know that's an aspect of ultra running that some people do come back to this for is is that feeling of being cut off. And I, I'm not sure if I can think of a better place within the UK to feel that cut yeah. off than, than Noidart. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Um, I love that we lost signal on our phones on the ferry crossing. Um, as long as I knew that my, you know, my kids were OK and they knew that I was OK, that's kind of all that matters. Um, yeah, I, I love, I'm, I am a bit of a, sort of a lone wolf in that sense. Um, but also because of my job all day, I'm talking and I'm around people and I love that, but I'm also the type of person that I just like to go and take myself off to a quiet room at the end of the day and just have, you know, I'm really happy with my own company. <laughs> I know some people's like their worst nightmare, they just can't sit with themselves for 10 minutes, but um, for me, I'm quite happy with that. So yeah, I mean, that's why I sort of do these things and why I like to choose a race I do is because you, you do find yourselves out in the middle of nowhere and, um, you know, it's just, it's lovely just to, I had a bit of a cry actually on day two. <laughs> So on that same mountain pass, I had my music on. I don't always run with music, especially during a race, but uh, I had my music on and I had um, randomly had the soundtrack from Last of the Mohicans, which has got bagpipes in it. And I just remember, I mean, they were like really joyful tears. I just yeah. remember stopping and looking around with these bagpipes in my ears. And I was like, this, this, this is amazing. This is why I'm doing it. It was just, it was a really, really lovely moment where I just thought, God, look where I am. I can't get here any other way than on foot. And um, yeah, so that was a really sort of lovely moment, but slightly cheesy as well. But <laughs> You know what? People don't talk about those kind of moments enough. I, I am not here for the idea that it's somehow a sign of weakness to admit to feeling that moved by a place. Like I, I had a couple of hours on stage two where it was just me and a few of the horses out beyond the oh. deer fence waiting for runners to come through, spread out every sort of 20, 30 minutes at that point. Now, I was out there for a good few hours just on my own, yes. and it was just blissful. Yeah. yeah. You just don't get to do that in life, do you? Like, life is so fast-paced um, for all of us, and, you know, when do you ever really get to do that? Um, yeah, and to just genuinely feel it. It, it yeah. you know you can be overwhelmed in a positive way and it, it's nice to have one of those moments no oh, yeah. that's amazing and i guess that's tapped us into talking about sort of noid art itself yeah. um it's hard for me to talk about it because obviously i sound biased but i couldn't get over noid art the first time i'd seen it i it, it's Incredible. it's film scenery it's it's not a real place surely it's something that ai might design if you asked it to show you you know pictures of the most beautiful place you can think of in the uk yeah what can you talk about him like what were some of your favorite uh, parts that you went through i mean yeah gosh it, it it is isn't it like what you get on that um i mean actually starting really on the train journey from Glasgow. <laughs> that train journey is really spectacular. I'd, I'd heard as much. And then we got to Maleg and stayed over. Um, it, so it's that, that ferry crossing is your sort of first sight of Noidart. Um, yeah, and it really is just breathtaking. Um, yeah, I mean, getting there, I didn't really know much about Noidart, actually. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, I hadn't really done my research on it. So it was quite interesting to hear a bit more about that, that from the Woodland Trust guys on the, the night that they did their talk um, and also sort of Chris just sort of dropping in sort of little nuggets of information here and there is really interesting but um, yeah absolutely extraordinary place um, it, it's I'm glad that it's so hard to get to <laughs> even though my bank account was <laughs> less pleased um, it took me so I live in like North Oxfordshire so I had to get a car ride to Luton Airport then I got a plane then I got a bus to Glasgow train station. Then I got a five hour train journey. Then I stopped home and then I got a ferry. <laughs> so, I mean, it took me best part of a day and a half to get door to door or door to tent door. Um, it quite literally took me half the time to get to the middle of Sahara Desert when I did the MDS. <laughs> Yeah, when uh, we do our Arctic race, I could get to the start line of the Arctic race and back to my house in the time it takes us to get up to Noidart. Yeah, it's, I can yeah. believe that. Yeah. I mean, it's so, you know, it's a bit of an adventure just getting there in the first place. Um, but yeah, but I'm pleased it is because 
I would hate to see it start to be like developed and I, I know they want to bring in tourists and absolutely it's the right thing to do for them but um you know I'd, I'd hate to see it it's so unspoiled and you know other than that tiny little community who are so lovely um it really is untouched and I I, I would you know it'd be so sad if that changed I hear you. And I'm going to be talking to the Rangers later this afternoon, actually. And, you know, we're going to be talking about a lot of their projects. And mm -hmm. I get that. There is a feeling of, no, it's our secret now. We're in on it. Yeah. We, it, it like, it has to stay like it is. Yeah. I, I think they're very aware that although, you know, tourism is obviously a good you know, revenue stream for them. And if they're going to fund their sustainability projects, they've got to do that kind of thing and yeah. get the news out there. But I, I don't think they'd like... It, I don't think they'd let it fall to pieces. That that no, community no, are doing didn't. such a good job of of looking yeah. after that place. Yeah, definitely. Uh, funny enough, I was with a client this morning, and she said, "I think I might be going to the same place you did." And we've been actually going to Noidart uh, next week, and I was so envious. I was like, "Oh, you're going to love it!" I said, "It's literally the most beautiful place on the planet," and I said, "It's just amazing." Um, and she was like really worrying about losing her phone signal. I was like, "It's the best thing. Just get off your phone, other than yeah. pictures." Yeah. Don't worry about it. Enjoy being cut off. Yeah. Ideal. Definitely. Uh, okay. Well, I, I, I'm starting to run out of questions here, and I think we're <laughs> starting to run out of hyperbole about how amazing Noidart is. Um, <laughs> this is not enough adjectives, is there? No, not quite. <laughs> um, so I guess at this point, it just remains to say once again, congratulations. That was absolutely yeah. outstanding. Yeah, um, well, thank you. It's, uh, well, thanks to you and, and Chris and the team as well for making it such an extraordinary event. It's it really is unique. Um, and I well, would... Chris and Nick can take the main thanks on uh, on that bit. I just run around and take photos. No, but I don't know. I greatly think appreciate it. It's a pretty hard shift. It's um, yeah. I think you should all take a bit of credit. But yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic event. I think anyone thinking about it, just you know, as I said to Jenny, just hit the button on it. Just you know. And the good thing about this event is you can pay in installments as well. So that, that works really well for me. I wouldn't have necessarily been able to just kind of fork out the cost of it in one go. So it, that's very helpful. So again, anyone thinking of doing it, I think, you know, there's ways and means around these things. And you've just neatly led me into the question that I forgot to ask you, which is one that we actually talked about before I started recording. So not great for me there, but let's leave on this. If anyone is thinking of signing up for this yeah. next year, what one thing should they be doing or bringing with them or do they need to know in advance to make sure they have a good race? Um, God, that's a good question. You know, put, Doesn't have to be one, you, yeah. They put me on the spot, but you did ask me this earlier. I've had time to think about it and I saw that everyone asked it just because they're, like, it's hard to pinpoint one thing. But I think definitely, um, I think... Tra like the training is obviously going to be the most important thing. Like, don't underestimate how tough it is. It is a fantastic event. You're in a beautiful place with amazing people, um, and there's all these really wonderful things about it, including the terrain. But but it is really tough. So um, I think a lot of people worry when they look at these events that they don't know how to replicate that type of terrain. I live in flat Warwickshire. <laughs> Um, I couldn't, you know, it's pretty hard to, to, to train for mountain stuff around here, but you know, there's ways and means around it. Um, I got, I don't have a stair climber, but I, if I had one, that's what I would have been doing. Instead, I used the box and I just stepped up and down on a box, up and down, up and down <laughs> with my pack on, um, you know, I did put in a lot of sort of hill reps, that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, you just got to get creative with your training for these type of things so that you are really well prepared. Um, and make sure that you are fully prepared with everything because once you're out there there is nothing you know no. there's no shops is there so <laughs> you're not nipping to decathlon if you've uh, not brought a bit of kit no, you, no no i wish i'd probably taken slightly warmer clothes for the evening because i was just so cold um at night time um why i didn't i don't know because i've got a pair of really lovely thermal leggings which i wore on the weekend when i camped in in uh, snowdonia <laughs> some reason they didn't make it into my night bag when I went to Noid's Art, but they would have been really helpful. <laughs> oh, well, next time. Yeah. Well, incredible. Look, uh, once again, thanks very much, Lauren. I really appreciate you taking the time out today. Pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. It's been lovely chatting. No worries. Bye for now. <laughs> Bye. Excellent. 
thank you once again to Lauren and to Fred and to Axel. Um, I really enjoyed those interviews. I hope you enjoyed listening to them as well. Uh, plenty of really interesting, inspiring stuff to draw out of there. Now, through the runners, we've now heard about the race. Through our course director, we've now heard about the race. Um, we understand it's a very difficult course in a very, very beautiful area. Let's look a bit beyond the course itself and talk about the peninsula at large. Let's talk about some of the community projects that are going on there um, that I find so inspiring whenever we're up in Inverary. We are about to talk to Lorna from the Noidart Forest Trust, and we're going to talk to Finley from the Noidart Ranger Service. And these are both people that are heavily involved in very, very positive and inspiring community projects. There's a real sense of scale to what this tiny community and once again we're talking about 120 130 people um there's a massive impact that this relatively small community are managing to have over an enormous area around them um and that's really really inspiring stuff we're going to dig a bit more deeply now into what it is that they're doing and how their projects tie in with each other and and just propel this positive momentum that they've got going at the moment um, and obviously, we're going to touch a little during that on how the Highland Ultra as a race can work to support those community projects, can do its best to be a part of that community, not just turning up once a year, causing chaos and buggering off again, but leaving resources behind that they can use that are genuinely of worth to them and building connections and finding other ways of supporting these projects along the way as well. If only by doing stuff like this, where we use our platform to let these guys tell you about the incredible stuff that they're doing. And that's what we're going to do today. I'm not going to do too much introduction here, um, only to tell you that I, I love these guys. I'm really glad that they managed to find the time to sit and talk to me. And what they're doing is genuinely inspiring to me. I feel positive every time I leave Inverie and, and head back home, not because I'm leaving, but because of the time that I spent there and the effect that it's had on me. I'm hoping you guys are going to get the same thing out of it. And we're going to dig a bit further in. Uh, th there's a lot of talk um, at the moment about, you know, trading T-shirts for trees and carbon offsetting and stuff like that. And all of those things are fantastic. They're, they are all wonderful and they contribute and they're a positive thing to do. Um, what we're going to talk about here is how the sort of resources associated with that are actually used. Um, we are going to talk about how the contributions from the race fees at the Highland Ultra are used by these guys in a more wide-ranging way than that. And uh, it, it's not just the planting of the trees. I know that's the first thing you see in the headlines every time, and it's 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 catchy for the sloganing, but really any any scheme like that that you are investing in anytime you're doing that some of what you're contributing is going into the wider logistics involved um the people who are planting these trees the maintenance of those trees the fences that need to go up around them to protect them they, they, these are projects with decades long lifespans with enormous footprints that need a lot of looking after and we're, we're going to talk today about how these guys manage these gargantuan projects and how the highland ultra feeds into those projects to leave a positive legacy behind when we do leave in very each year good morning then lorna lorna it's it's really good to talk to you again i i I haven't seen you since I left Inverie, and I never really like leaving Inverie. How have, how have you been since the race? Yeah, it's been good, thanks. Um, the weather deteriorated a bit, but good for the trees. <laughs> good for the trees. Glad it waited for our runners to leave before yeah, it deteriorated. Absolutely. They were battered <laughs> enough, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it, it must be quieter there after we've gone. I, I, I feel a bit like we cause chaos when we come over on the ferry. Oh, I don't. Not too bad. No, I think you're pretty self-contained. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. I, I, we feel like your noisy neighbours when we turn up. We, you know, we try not to rock the boat too much, but yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of us. Um, so, for the benefit of the people listening to this who who don't know much about who you are and what you do, um, 
<laughs> I'm going to drop a big broad question on you. So, Lorna Schofield, you're with the Noidart Forest Trust. What can you try and sum up what that means? What what your role is and what the Noidart Forest Trust do? Yeah, sure. I'll try. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Noidart Forest Trust is a, a community-led charity which manages the woodland on the Noidart Peninsula on behalf of the Noidart Foundation. Um, and the Noidart Foundation is the community landowner um, and they own about 17,000 acres of the peninsula. Um, Noidart Forest Trust takes responsibility for the woodland. So that involves everything from managing the existing woodland to creating new woodlands. Um, the vision is to link up the woodland across the peninsula. And by doing that, we're creating stepping stones for the bio biodiversity um, and you know to improve the resilience of the of the habitat. Um, we're also using the the existing woodland and the timber as a resource to kind of increase our community's resilience and and strength. So that's you know, we're investing in the local economy, we're providing jobs and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, we like to think that we're kind of three pronged. We're doing social, uh, working to achieve social benefits, environmental benefits and economic benefits. Oh, fantastic. I, th I think the word I used when we quickly chatted before this was sort of holistic. And that word keeps buzzing around my head a little bit. It's part of what I really enjoyed speaking to the rangers for instance and part of what i really enjoy when i come over to Inverary is that feeling that you know you're you're the no doubt forest trust they're the ranger service but everyone is working for the benefit of the foundation of the community that yeah. that owns that land over there and i just think that's an amazingly positive thing to to get to see no doubt itself is it's beautiful it's stunning but what you guys are doing there is is genuinely inspiring so what when we talk about linking up the woodland and stuff like that um i know that part of what the highland ultra does with the race fees we there is there is some support there is uh, an element of the race fees that goes towards support in what you guys are doing so yeah. for the benefit of anyone out there that's wondering where that money goes what 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 is it that you guys are sort of filtering that funding into? So we're we're we've almost doubled the area of woodland on on the community owned land in the twenty or twenty four years that we've been um, doing what we do, and we're doing because of the the number of deer on the land, we can't and and because there are no not enough existing trees and woodlands on the land, we have to create pockets of woodland and we have to protect those pockets of woodland with with deer fences um, and then we we have to employ people to put up the fences and prepare the ground and then people to plant the trees we have to buy the trees so there's a lot goes into establishing a woodland it's it, planting a tree is is just a very small part of that so we tr we, we're very keen to get that message across that what what be, um, beyond ultimate's money is going to support is the whole shebang. It's about creating new woodlands, um, and part of that is planting the trees. But it's a much wider thing, um, and has much wider benefits because the the tree itself and the the woodland habitat just is so important for the general biodiversity of of the land. So it's um, yeah, it's really really important. No, that's that's good to hear. Again, it's it's not just putting that tree in the ground, and that's you know that's a part of it. Obviously, no no, no issue with that. <laughs> Plant the trees by all means, but there's a lot more to it than that. There's there's a lot of work involved in getting that tree, getting that tree to where it needs to be, getting yeah. it in the ground, keeping it protected, and then ongoing monitoring and planning and everything else that you guys do. Mm -hmm. It's it's a much bigger operation than just yeah. putting that sapling in the ground. Yeah, in general, we've got to. Well, what, while, while we have to keep the, the deer fences up, the, we like to say the deer fences are temporary, but temporary in forestry terms is about 20, 20 to 30 years. But the, you know, the, the plan is that once the trees are resilient enough to cope with whatever deer levels there are around about, we'll be taking those fences down. So we've also got to plan for, for that. You know, how are we going to 
pay for that because because of our remote location, you know, some it adds an extra dimension to how you do things as as you guys well know. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. A bad weather day can really throw your whole schedule off. <laughs> um, yeah. I think you've struck on something quite important there as well when you talk about sort of the length of time involved in something like this. You know, if we think of something as temporary on a day to day basis, that might mean it's something that's going to be in there for a few hours or days or weeks, maybe. Yeah. Temporary in terms of growing a forest and <laughs> developing yeah. that, that, that biodiverse climate there is, is a we're talking about much longer time scales. And I think it's easy to turn up on Noidart, look at it on face value and just be stunned by how beautiful it is. And it is. But you can see past that a little to how it should have looked or how it would have looked before before human intervention there. Mm. And I, it, that's that's not always an easy thing to picture. So is that something you can paint for us a little bit? I mean, what's what are you working towards? What would returned to its natural state look like to you? And what sort of time scale are we talking about there? Because what you guys are working on is is a really grand project here. Yeah, um, I suppose what, what we're working towards is a, is a kind of balanced landscape where, you know, at the moment it feels like, you know, we, trees and in a lot of areas can't regenerate. They can't, the seed from the tree is not going to take off in areas out with, with the deer fences at the moment. And um, we're trialing with, with the foundation, we're working on a project called the Black Hills. So there's essentially 3000 hectares of land is, is um, fenced off. So the deer manager within that big area will reduce the numbers of deer so that trees can grow without further fencing. So I guess the, the the vision is that that will be such a success that that will be what the community and everyone else wants to wants to see happen so that we've got you know pockets of woodland that are regenerating naturally and also that you know we don't have to do such large scale woodland we can do little pockets where we know the trees will grow best um and we're so yeah in terms of time scale, I don't know, 20, no. 30, 40. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we've been doing what we do for 24 years. And, you know, you could, you already, the woodlands that we stand, st started planting in the early years are already, you know, looking like like woodlands. So, so yeah. It's it's uh, you're in it for the long game. <laughs> yeah, and I I think that's what I was sort of trying to drive out there. I I know I can't ask you for a definitive answer now on how long this takes. They, it's it's not something where there's sort of one absolutely clear focus goalpost in the distance that you can go and hit. This is it's an ongoing situation, and yeah. you guys are all working together on it. But I think that's what I'm trying to get across is that this isn't a case of we're going to plant ten thousand trees here and walk out. That's no. that's not how something like this works. No, no. I mean, every every one of the woodlands has, to, you know, there's there has to still be. We have to st check the fences. We have to check the trees are growing okay. Um, you know, the the deer management team kind of keep an eye on them and make sure there's no deer that have managed to get over the fence or somebody's left a gate open or something. So, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's not just trees in the ground. Off we go. <laughs> and it, if we're going to go sort of a little broader than just talking about the Noidart Peninsula and, and the benefits of what you're doing there, it's what you're doing is kind of a model that other people could potentially follow. Well, that's how it seems from the outside that what I find particularly positive about coming across to Inverie and, and being around you guys is I always come away from Inverie with a little more hope than I went in with that, that actually you can glue a bunch of people together and have them work for the common good and what you guys are doing there is is pretty inspiring and is i i know you're not here to showboat but is is that part of what you guys are trying to build in the long term as well that this this isn't just about looking after the noid art peninsula this is about practicing with and showing the benefits of models that could work elsewhere as well right yeah i guess it is kind of indirectly yeah but i mean also 
we feel a bit of a responsibility as a community because we are fortunate enough to have access to the you know this big area of land that you know needs to be restored so we we feel a responsibility to do that as well and to play our part in in you know fighting against climate change by planting trees and sequestering carbon and in improving biodiversity so so yeah i i wouldn't say the creating a model is our, our primary objective, but certainly, you know, we're always happy to speak to people about what we do and how we do it. But well, I know our runners are always fascinated to hear from you. Um, the, we've, we've heard that a lot in the feedback that what they've really enjoyed about being able to hear from you and hear from the runners is it just fills out that picture. And Noidart's beautiful. We know that, but now they understand a little bit more about what they're seeing and that, that adds so much value to it. And ed educating people that come across to Noida must be quite an important part of what you do as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Rangers do a very good job of that. Um, they're, they're, mu they're very much the kind of public facing side of things. Um, we tend to squirrel ourselves away in the woods and the, <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're good at what they do. <laughs> no, excellent. Um, and I hope you don't mind, but I'd, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about you and how you came to be involved in this. Are you are you from the area? What's 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 your story that led you to be here as sort of one of the guardians of the woodlands on Noida? <laughs> um, just kind of opportunities. I just I ended up in Noida, and then um, in the kind of late mid to late nineties, and at that time. Um, the estate was privately owned. Uh, the community was were you know working towards a community buyout. Things were pretty dilapidated. Um, there was a community effort um, to pull together a woodland management plan uh, and you know a way of managing the woodland that the community could be involved in, no matter who owned the land. So that's why the Nordic Forest Trust was formed. So. Um, luckily, the community buyout was successful. So we and our kind of establishment came in about the same time. So I was involved with that from the start. I was involved in in kind of a little bit in the background of the community buyout. So yeah, I've just always been really invested in in making this place work for the community and and um, improving the habitat and the environment. So. Yeah. I can only imagine what that was like as a time. I mean, you mentioned there the sense of the community senses their responsibility for the environment around them. And I, I think that's wonderful. Like you having come together and taking over ownership of that area, your your first sense is, right, we, we have to plan. We have to we have to make this better like that. Yeah. We have a responsibility to this place now. But that must have been difficult at first, pulling together all the threads to to build these systems. Yeah. Uh, I, and I guess we're kind of veering off now into the kind of history of the community in Inverie. But if if you don't mind um, following me on this whim, what what was that time like of, well, now we've got this thing. Yeah. Now, now what do we do? Well, the Forest Trust in some respects was, was a kind of, because we already had the Woodland Management Plan in place and we'd managed to secure some funding it was kind of like uh, okay we'll get on and start doing this now but certainly the wider picture like for the foundation was it was really daunting because well we were just a bunch of people that there was only 60 people at, in the community at that time so it was a very small group of people um wow and and yeah <laughs> it was it was daunting but you know, bit by bit, it's it's um, come together, and yeah, it's growing and and flourishing. So yeah, the community is about 120 now. So kind of like the woodland, the community is almost doubled in size. <laughs> Brilliant. I well, look, I, I'm I promise not to keep you for too much of your day, and I I do realise as a generate a crossover i love that the nature of just talking to you where you are is the the generator might go off so we might just not be able to talk to each other again in yeah. a little while like, Look, that, that's quite exciting in itself because that that means that that's the switch over to the fully upgraded 
Um, oh, I didn't realize. I yeah. oh, that's a much bigger moment than I thought. I thought you were just talking about maybe switching from one generator to another. This no. is this is the end of that happening. Yeah. Well, we've just been on generator for six weeks while the the kind of turbine and everything is is kind of linked up to the upgraded pipeline. So, yeah. Fingers well, crossed. <laughs> right. Forgive my ignorance and following another thread, but I I don't know an awful lot about the sort of. Uh, hydro generation okay. project yeah. there so what have you guys managed to build there now because this this sounds so, like a bit of a momentous occasion when you lose <laughs> power here so the Noidart foundation has a trading subsidiary called Noidart renewables um when the community took over the estate there was a hydro in place which had been put in i think in the 60s or 70s so in in the late 90s it was it was failing. <laughs> um, and there was, it was upgraded in the early 2000s, but then there was, there were some failings starting to, to show their ugly head again. So now the renewables team have put together this massive energy security project, which has upgraded the pipeline and the, and the network. Um, so it means that our hydro generation is going to be much more reliable and efficient and yeah so yeah we're going Brilliant. even greener <laughs> well i mean we've had to be on on a diesel generator but that was just a, a temporary measure while the the finishing touches were put together so absolutely that was a stepping stone that got you to where you are now that, yeah. that, that's absolutely brilliant <laughs> um and look, I've I've just taken a quick glance at my notepad and realized I forgot what I really thought was going to be a bit of a key question. And this this might be a good place to leave things anyway. Um, for the benefit of anybody who doesn't sort of inherently sense an answer to this question, what are the benefits of doing what you're doing? Why are we increasing biodiversity in that area and, and putting these woodlands back in place? Because at the moment, we're like, yeah, we're, we're planting these woodlands. That's absolutely brilliant. But it, it, treat us as stupid. Why should we be excited about doing that? Um, well, we've got a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis on our hands. So anything, everything that people can do to improve that situation so by planting trees we're um, sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere um, and we're creating habitats to in increase biodiversity um, and doing our little bit in this little corner of the earth to to um, fight you know hopefully stop things happening that we don't want to happen and there you go <laughs> in a sentence that's that's where we are and I, I, I'm going to round that off just by saying, I think that's what I was driving at earlier, that I know it's not the primary reason that you guys are doing what you're doing, but what you're doing is inspiring other people and could have far, much further reaching effects. And I just think that's fantastic. So keep doing what you're doing and know that I'm immensely proud that there's some benefit of us bringing our chaotic race up onto your beach once a year it's uh, it's greatly appreciated you guys have made us feel incredibly welcome and we really appreciate that great um yeah it's good to see you guys every year um we enjoy making your medals too <laughs> Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Again, holistic. Everything's tied in together. Even our wooden medals are made there. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, well, look, thank you very much for today, Lorna. It's, I, I've really, really appreciated this. And as I said to you before I started this, I feel like there's maybe a, a, a longer interview somewhere down the line because there's, there's loads of interesting stuff I'd like to talk to you about. But thanks very much for your time this morning. Great. Thank you, Will. Good afternoon then. Finlay. Finlay, uh, once again, I know I've said this to you before, that is an excellent fleece. Oh, thanks very much. Um, it, it could probably do with a wash. My hygiene standards have slipped considerably since I moved to the, the countryside and became somewhat feral. But uh, yeah, the fleece gets a lot, lot of compliments. <laughs> yeah, and deservedly so. Um, <laughs> yeah. so uh, how are you doing, bud? It's been a, been a couple of weeks since I left No Dark. How have you been? Yeah, been doing well. I mean, the, the, the season's really kicking off now, what we're in mid-May. Um, so we've got kind of 
school trips coming over, end of year stuff, project weeks. So I, I've I've uh, mainly been doing some. Uh, I don't want to say babysitting, but uh, edu- educating uh, youngsters on um, what we're doing around here. I, I took a group of students out to do some rhododendron uh, clearing um, on Monday morning, and uh, that was fun. Tested my patience somewhat, but they they, they were actually really game. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, I can imagine a group of students loving that. I, I, just for a bit of context for anyone listening to this, uh, there's a, I sensed a real dislike of rhododendrons while I was up there. What's what, what's the story there? Uh, it's a public enemy number one here, really. Um, we I was actually in a meeting with the Nordart Forest Trust this morning, and they reckon they've cleared probably 99% of the rhododendron ponticum here. And basically, it's a super invasive uh, plant species, which... So very pretty and eye-catching and uh, I'd say in many ways synonymous with parts of the highlands. Yeah, I mean, you go into the Isle Isle of Arran, it's uh, omnipresent there. You, you take the train from Fort William to Malik and uh, the, the, the railway is practically lined with it. Very eye-catching, but super invasive. And it by clearing it, it means our native woodland can get a foothold and uh, we can start to see the regeneration of uh, yeah, native woodland. I love that. I, I, you know, this leads me nicely into what I really wanted to ask you about, which was, you know, who are the Noid Art Ranger Service and what do you guys do? And there's more of a breadth to what you guys get up to than I had realized before I sort of saw what you do and met you guys. Rhododendron bashing was something that just wasn't on my list, but it's all about taking care of the woodlands in that area, right? It's all about... Well, I, I would say that's predominantly the Noid Art Forest Trust. Yeah. Um, they they would um, they're they're in charge with of uh, tree planting, managing the woodland, clearing rhododendrons. But what I might do is facilitate educational events and voluntary events to take people out and give them a real kind of explanation of what the Noida Forest Trust are doing in the area. Um, I absolutely wouldn't take credit for the decades of hard work that uh, the Noida Forest Trust have put in. But um, yeah, I mean that that kind of moves on to what I do do here, which is educating visitors um, and educating tourists, trying to foster more of a relationship between tourists and locals. Um, that can be a case of um, leading a daily tour. So we do a public tour. We like to keep it affordable. So it's um, just £20 for two and a half hours, usually three hours. I get a bit carried away. Or we're just kind of wandering around the village woodland. Um, I, I try to, we try to kind of tap into what people are interested in and I'd say nine times out of 10, that's in the community itself. So uh, as much as I like to study the flora and fauna and um, kind of encourage a bit of foraging, people are just kind of fascinated with how we operate around here and uh, yeah, educating people and maybe um, <laughs> removing some of the prejudices about like the, our small communities and um, just kind of removing the murkiness like, I think a lot of people think that we live purely for tourism and come winter we shut down. But the reality is we're we're working some of us seven days a seven days a week uh, every month of the year. I, I wouldn't put myself in that category, but uh, yeah, we're hard working lot over here, um, and hospitality is just a small part of what we do. It's a big part of what the ranger service do. Though. I can imagine, and I. It- this makes sense in a way, like uh, with what I was saying before, it's not my intention to sort of take credit from the Forest Trust and put it on you, but from the outside, it's easy to see you guys as sort of different faces of one organization in a sense, because you are so, it is a community with, with different aspects of it all supporting each other. I can understand why people are coming in there, frustrating as it is when you're there to maybe teach them a bit about the flora and fauna really just want to hear about how your community do what you do because i got to say from the outside coming into Inveree I have never left that place willingly I, I, <laughs> I get on that ferry thinking I could just stay you know yeah yeah well it, it, I, I, I came for one week to climb the Monroes and uh, it's been two years now so um, the Monroes have been climbed and I'm still here and yeah I, I definitely got that calling myself and Oh, there's been a couple moments where I've wanted, I've yearned for the city life, which I was used to. But um, there's something just really special and almost magnetic about the place, and it just there's something so positive about how, the way the community is run. It's not completely straightforward, um, and the, the humans aren't, are they? Day to day issues, but um, it's. 
I'd say overall, uh, overwhelmingly, quite a, a, a positive place and a positive movement. We are all inter interdependent, um, all 130 residents. Um, we all look out for each other. I wasn't here during COVID, but um, I think that, that helped to further foster this kind of, um, kind of looking out for one's neighbour. Um, and yeah, the organisations as well, for the most part, were interdependent as well. So while the Noidart Foundation is separate from the Noidart Forest Trust, we work very closely together. Um, yeah, I just think that's excellent. It, it, it's, it's great to watch happening. Um, so on days where you're maybe not um, coaching school kids, bashing rhododendrons or, or showing them around the village, what, what, what sort of area do you cover and what, what might your day-to-day -day look like if you are uh, sort of out in the hills a bit more? In the, I'd like to be out in the hills much more than I am. Um, I, I'd say recent examples would be, I, I try to work actually, as well as promoting my fellow, the fellow organisations, whether that's the Forest Trust or um, actually my office fellows, the, the deer management team. I think it's really important that the Ranger Service, in order to improve our education offering, I think it's really important that we work alongside these people. So in winter time, when my work drops from five days a week to three days a week, I'll join in the deer stalking. I'll, uh, I, I, I did less tree planting this winter. Um, I'm a little bit jaded by my first full season when I was here, but uh, I, I'll join in with some tree planting. Um, so uh, part of what we do here is kind of interacting with our fellow organisations and our, our fellow employees. Um, we're also, um, I mean, this summer's kind of been dominated by the setting up of a ranger station, which we're kind of looking at as a kind of tourist information hub where we can drive um, tourists more towards ourselves, um, so we can field their questions they have in the area and kind of better promote our uh, surrounding businesses and um, just what we do here as well. It's, it's not all about driving profit to certain businesses. It's about saying, this is what they do. This is what we do. Um, um, uh, other work I was doing in the hill last week, I, I've been out with the deer management team doing some um, herbivore monitoring, so browsing monitoring. So that basically involves going out onto a selected part of the hill, which we monitor every year to see the impact of deer, of like herbivore browsing, so predominantly red deer, and uh, just checking that. Um, the deer management side of things is having a, a positive impact and um, what with the Black Hills uh, conservation project, we're basically about to set off, uh, separate 3,000 hectares of land. I mean, we've pretty much done it. Uh, from the rest of the peninsula so we can um, at the moment there's a compensatory cull where we're driving these deer out and sadly culling them as well um, but that's going to allow us to kind of take on this landscape wide project where we can plant thousands and thousands of trees and um, regenerate peatland and see our biodiversity significantly increase so it was great to get out in the field with them last week and um, just look at the impact we're having so far, and that's before the Black Hills Conservation Project really gets a, a toehold. So, that's, uh, yeah, amazing. And look, you've you've mentioned the Black Hills Conservation Project a couple of times, so I'm uh, out of my own curiosity. If nothing else, I'm going to have to ask what that is in a moment. But you, you've sort of touched on a wider thing there that some of the work that you do is supporting these conservation projects, and these are very long term projects. They're about and I'm going to say this in the most ham-fisted way, and this is for you to correct me if I'm getting the gist of this wrong, but I, I guess this is an area people look at as rewilding. We are, you are sort of reinstating the forest to an extent in those areas and, and allowing things to return to a state that they might have been in before we came in and muddled everything up. Does, does that sound about right? You're not far off. I, I personally, and I know some people in the community as well, we're not entirely fond of the term rewilding. We kind of look at it as more as like land regeneration. So while uh, what we're doing over there, a big part of it is um, kind of re-establishing these habitats that human interaction has caused to um, has caused them to degenerate. Um, this is also a kind of cultural landscape that's been lived in by humans for centuries and centuries and up until the 1850s um, was 
I mean, our, our population, some claim it was up to 2,000. I don't think it was quite that high, but I think we're looking at between 1,500 and 2,000 people. We're living along the coast and up the glens. Um, and part of the Black Hills Conservation Project is kind of laying the foundations for people to return to some of these um, cleared settlements um, or at least kind of uh, widen some of the settlements which have already been kind of re-established, such as Dune and Radarich. Wow, I hadn't realised that. The, the sort of part of these efforts as well are about bringing people back to those areas that were cleared. Yeah, I mean, we, we're hoping to see kind of, uh, th this could be years, decades down the line, but the, re -establish the establishment of woodland crofts. And um, we very much see people as a part of this project. And I think there's something that's often lost when um, the Highlands are promoted in the media uh, are the people. You'll see um, there was an article earlier this year, I, I won't name the publication because I, I don't want to publicly shame them, but it, it just described how they left the city in the south um, to kind of escape and be alone. Um, and there wasn't one mention of a local or a person. Um, and I think that that's just something that gets lost, that this is a lived in landscape, a landscape that's had huge, like, um, it's been kind of worked on by humans for centuries and centuries. Um, for, pos think, for positive and negatives. But um, yeah, we're, we're kind of keen to make sure that people know this is a lived-in landscape, was a la lived-in landscape as well. Um, and in the future, we'll hopefully um, continue to flourish. That strikes me as a sort of particularly important aspect of what you do when you are teaching people about about what your work is, about these conservation projects, and, and about the history of the area that you're in there is the you know I, I know areas of the peak district not far from where i am and you look out on it with your city eyes and what you see is untouched countryside for miles yeah. and miles and miles but you've got to look past a you know possibly a few centuries of of history there to realize that that's what you are seeing is scarred and does yeah. show the marks of human habitation and and it is not quite the untouched picture of serenity that you thought it was before and i'm i'm not sure that people really realize that until they hear you talking it through yeah i mean i we, you leave the deer fence here and it's people will be like wow wilderness um but the reality is that this isn't what scotland um historically should look like i mean historically um, centuries, centuries ago, um, this isn't what Scotland should look like. It's, it's a carcass that's been stripped bare by um, land mismanagement, um, the prolif proliferation of red deer numbers, deforestation. I mean, what we're trying to do in the Black Hills Conservation Project is kind of, to an extent, though, though we, some of us reject the term rewilding, we're just trying to turn that yeah. in our land back into what we think what scotland should look like really i think rewilding is just a hashtag that people use on instagram when it's a buzzword I, I, and yeah. yeah no i mean before i came to noida i used it plenty and um at the start of my my time here i learned it i, I used it frequently as well man yeah. i i I really like that when we come along on this race, we get the opportunity to have you and Drew and whoever's else around actually speak to the runners about this stuff because it it adds something to the event. It adds something to what they're doing for them to understand a bit more about what they can see as they're going through. Because it would be easy for them to come in with their, with their city eyes, do their race, be incredibly impressed by it, and walk away and, and not take any of that message with them. And, you know... While I'm on a roll, I think it's incredibly positive what you guys do. I I come away from Inveree, and part of the reason it's difficult to leave Inveree is you come away with just a little bit of hope that if people work together in a communal way, you can change things back. Things can be improved. Now, I, I think that's a big part of what you guys do. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it would be too far to say that we strive to be a positive example to communities around Scotland and then and, and not not just small villages but like um larger um settlements as well cities towns like what we do here is overwhelmingly positive and yeah we can make a difference I think you you could as you say you can come to Noida and um, whether you're a day trip or you're staying for a week and you can have an absolutely wonderful time without talking to 
anyone with inside knowledge or local knowledge. But what we do is we, we kind of try to add a bit of colour to that trip and, um, you know, um, lift the green veil of sorts. You can wander through the, the village woodland and have a wonderful atmospheric time, but you can't quite interpret what's going on there, what, um, what's actually around you, what's happened, what's, ha- what's happening, what's going to be the future of the woodland. Um, and, and with your um, race participants, um, there, there's overwhelmingly a first for knowledge from them. There's, so me and Drew gave brief talks at the start of the, the, um, the race, but I think what was interesting was the Q&A dragged on for way longer than the talks. There was just, everyone's got a kind of itch, a question that's itching away at them that they want answered, and uh, we're more than happy to provide that. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I noticed that. It, I, I thought things were winding up sort of quite quickly. And actually, everyone's got questions in their back pocket. And it's, I guess what you've got here is a group of people with a vested interest in the, in the outdoors, in the countryside, you know, and them coming over and seeing what you guys are doing is, is excellent. And they have, they've got a thirst for it. We've seen that over and over again. So if you were walking into that tent for the first time thinking, do these guys even want to hear me chat for a bit? You you must realize now that they really do. Yeah, no, they're, they're, there's definitely, I mean, you don't sign up for an ultramarathon in, in the Highlands if you're not at least somewhat interested in the landscape. And um, yeah, I, I think my favorite question this year was someone asking if we had a funeral director or something like that, um, yeah. <laughs> which is a strange one. But uh, I mean, the, the silly questions like that and the, those who just genuinely want to understand a bit more about the, the community and how we function. I mean, it's not a silly question, really. It's uh, perfectly normal, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Quite morbid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just just very, very slightly. Um, well, it, just to talk about the race itself a little bit. I I have a bit of an odd experience when I come up to the Highlands because I come up for the race. There's the day when the runners arrive and suddenly the population of the area is double and and it's all quite chaotic and people are all over the place. And then the race disappears over towards Kinloch Horn and I generally stay in Inveree where Race HQ is for the next 24 hours and I hear everything go back to pin drop quiet again. Uh-huh. Like, we, we must bring chaos when we come over on the ferries like what, what's your experience of the race from from your side so I, i've been here for three races and i've been ranger for two of those races i remember the first time i, I was working as a tree planner up a uh, glen the goose in a plantation called clunery and i remember looking down at these racers and they were running through the wind and rain um and it was the only time i felt sorry for someone while i was doing that job because normally I was just feeling so it was I was full of self pity, but um, yeah, I mean there there is some amusement at why people would want to run this distance here. I mean it's notoriously um, prone to wet and windy conditions. It's the rough bounds of Noida. It's seriously rugged. So there's some people like, oh here here come the crazies again to do their big race. But um, I think what I really appreciate about the race this year was there was. Sometimes it's like water and oil when a big group of people come over and they don't quite integrate with the community as they might. And maybe that was the case with the first race or the second race. It wasn't completely like that. But this year we really started to see the community merge on that final night when the race had finished, when everyone was kind of gathered drinking and eating. And there was a kind of sharing of war stories from those who'd done the race. And then there was also sharing from the community stories of what life is like here. And it was a a really kind of positive experience and i think that's only going to improve going forward um yeah i get i get what you mean you know the first couple of times you meet someone for the you know there's yeah. always going to be a little bit of i'm not it's, sure it's about this yeah. and we're bringing yeah. this massive like i said we're, we're coming in once a year almost doubling the population mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of reasons to be a little cautious around each other but it really felt this time around like everyone just got involved that last night was lovely um yeah no yeah. absolutely it was um yeah seriously seriously positive and as you say like it it's kind of uncanny how it just becomes a ghost town quite suddenly um this isn't the london marathon we're talking about i think what was it yeah. 70 runners this year so you kind of have them just 
once they've gone uh, around the coast, they're kind of just being drip fed through the village. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think everyone just wants the best for these people and wants for them to finish the race. But there's always a bit of concern as well because it's such a big undertaking. Yeah, fully, fully bonkers. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> we know that. We, we've, we do these races in a number of different places around the world. And I think every, every local race team that we work with thinks that the runners are insane. And it, it's hard to argue with everyone at this point. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, I, I think I think we need, we need to get our first uh, local participant uh, to get involved with the race. Was was that volunteering? I just heard from you there. Oh, absolutely not! I can barely run five k at the moment. I don't think I fancy doing it. Uh, don't say that out loud. Start <laughs> early in twenty sixteen. I could barely run a five k. Chris managed to get me to run the ice ultra in February twenty seventeen. So seriously, word of this gets around, and you really might find yourself getting coached through a race. Oh, geez. Well, I mean, Steve, my dog's uh, getting more larger and larger walks, so maybe he'll, he'll drag me into the race next year. Who knows? Uh, and a cross p- participant. Incredible. It, don't think for a second I'm not going to put this bit out <laughs> behind the scenes when I get off this call, Finlay. I, it, in fact, we're recording the podcast now. I forget sometimes that I'm just talking to the person on the screen. This is yeah. it. It's on record. Oh, God. I should know <laughs> better. I used to be a journalist. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh well now i'm more nervous about questioning you <laughs> yeah well it, look I, I i mean i already said i don't want to take up too much of your time this afternoon but i i think it really is interesting to have this opportunity to talk to you about, no, about please. what you guys do and i i mean you've mentioned yourselves you've mentioned the noid art forest trust and you mentioned this what was it the black hills Black Hills Conservation Project, yeah. So what what is what is the crack there? What what are you guys working on at the moment? And I guess what I'm trying to get at here is is the scale of what you're trying to build. So yeah, so I mean, it's so this is the brainchild of uh, Jim Brown, who's our head stalker, and uh, uh, I'm not sure land manager is the title you'd most prefer. He's actually next door. I could just shout through to him, but uh, basically we, there's. Um, several existing tree plantations um, with fencing around them, uh, going from Loch Nevis to the Sound of Slay, which separates us on the mainland from Sky. Um, and we've received funding from the Nature, Scot- uh, Nature Restoration Fund to stitch that fencing together and completely, completely separate these 3,000 hectares from the rest of the peninsula. Peninsula is vast. I can't remember the exact uh, square footage. Um, you, you, you can look that up yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. But um, yeah, so the, the the initial step is getting that uh, deer that deer fencing in place, and then this compensatory colour talk talk about. But there's also a couple deer leaps um, in the fencing, so that it, they're almost one way ramps for the for the red deer to leave the area. Um, so once that once deer are once deer rather are down to a manageable level, we can look at um, the Noida Forest Trust rather can look at um, planting thousands of native woodland to increase carbon sequestration. We can look at uh, regenerating peatland, um, deep peatland, and ultimately we're we're hoping to see the biodiversity of the area rap- like significantly increase, and we're hoping to see the return of missing species or at least to lay the foundation for the return of missing species. So, I mean, our nearest red squirrel at the moment is about uh, 12 miles away in a place called Strathden. Um, I think that's, some people say Straven. Um But who's to say we might not, I mean, years, decades down the line, we might see the return of the red squirrel to the area because of the work that people like Jim Brown and Grant Holroyd and uh, Lorna Schofield are doing. So Grant Holroyd and Lorna Schofield of the Nordart Forest Trust. But uh, Amazing. I mean, it, it's, it's seriously, I think it's quite radical and ambitious for such a small community to be taking on this kind of landscape wide project. It's huge. And that's what I was trying to drive at. Like the, the just the surface end of what I've heard from you and Lorna about what the sort of long-term ambitions of the project you're working on are, are, massive in a sort of geographical scale like you said the peninsula is huge 
Yeah, the peninsula. I mean, it, it's about fifteen percent of the peninsula. The peninsula itself, which is, is vast. I, I wouldn't quote me on it. I think it's maybe forty thousand acres. Um, edit that out if that's incorrect. <laughs> um, and yeah, so fifteen percent of the peninsula is being set aside for this project. Or not set aside, but it's being it's being regenerated in this way. And uh, I mean, there's other pockets of land being regenerated elsewhere on the peninsula. But what's significant about this is it's not um, this kind of um, collection of or, or pockets of um, plantations. It's one vast area. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's seriously exciting. No, it absolutely so, is. If so, you know I, any I, fencers I, looking for a job, let, let us know. Yeah, well, I guess that kind of the last thing I had written down that I wanted to ask you is if 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 there is and I hope there's somebody listening to this podcast, but if there is somebody listening to this podcast right now and thinking, wow, it sounds amazing what they're doing up there. How could I support that? How, how would you answer that? Um, I think first and foremost, visit the area like uh, and kind of learn our story. Um, by visiting the area, you're immediately supporting lo the local economy, local businesses. Um, of course, I mean, I, I could have said, uh, give us your money, donate, uh, donate. We, the Noidart Foundation are a charity. Um, you can donate to Noidart Forest Trust and um, I think they have the Noidart Trees uh, scheme where you can donate money to them and they'll plant trees on your behalf. Um, but I, I think what I would recommend is get over here and like see what we're doing. It's seriously exciting. We've got our own off-grid hydro system um, which is creating clean energy for almost all of our residents. Um, we, um, yeah, we're, obviously the, the Black Hills Conservation Project I've already mentioned, the Northern Forest Trust are planting hundreds of thousands of trees every year. Um, it's come learn our story um, and, and come to our pub once it's open, which should be open, I'm hoping, June. Um, we're all hoping that. Yes, that's now in community hands, and um, it was fl flourishing before we started the, um, the refurbishment of the pub, and uh, I have no doubt that will be flourishing after that. Having dropped in myself after the uh, race last year, you were flourishing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It can be lively. That is a yeah. great little boozer. <laughs> yeah. And there's always the table across the road if necessary. Exactly. No, that's that's awesome. Like, it, it, I realise that what I'm putting out there opens the door to just being like oh yeah you could make a donation at this page and yeah you know if people want to go for it but i i'm glad you've said what you said because i absolutely mean what i say when i say i come away from invery with extra hope with more than i had when i went in with with the impression that genuinely massive conservation projects can be undertaken by a determined small community working together and though that's a fact that that is the impression I come away from being around you guys and being up in Inverie. That's what's left with me when I come away. And I think that's what you give to our runners when, when we put you in front of them. Yeah. So, I, mean, I, I would say the, the main thing I love about living in Noida and the main reason I'll be here for years to come. Um, it's going to be so embarrassing if I suddenly up sticks and leave in the next few months. <laughs> um, it's the tangible difference you feel you can make. I've lived in cities um, where it's easy to feel insignificant. I've come here and I have been welcomed. It's not maybe this Hollywood welcome, Hollywood Highland welcome you're expecting, but it's just been an overwhelmingly positive experience where you can get involved. If you're willing to get stuck in, get your hands dirty, roll up your sleeves, you can like seriously assist in accelerating these projects. And that's, yeah, I don't know. It's just really meaningful work is going on here and it's, amazing to be a part of that yeah and then you take that positivity with you and you take it back where you came from and you do the same thing there like this 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 is something that can spread people just need to come and learn from you guys that's, yeah that's, that's... Uh, well hopefully um we, we, we don't want to get too big-headed we know we're not perfect but um if someone can come here and feel like they can make a, a positive difference to the community they live in that's um that's awesome that's job done on our part amazing well look that's perfect. I think I am going to stop uh, badgering you and let you get on in your afternoon at that point. Not, but not at all, very thank much, you. Finley. I really appreciate you taking the time out today. I appreciate it as well. And, and th thanks to yourself. Thanks to Chris, Nick, Jenny, 
uh, Dean. Uh, you, you've all been a pleasure to work with. No, well, we really appreciate that. And the same from our side. You know, it, the relationships are always weird between people and we're a big unknown odd thing suddenly getting dropped into your environment and you have repeatedly accommodated and worked with us and it's the least we can do to do the least we can do to support you guys anything so i'm I'm glad to be talking to you today finley i hope a lot of people get to hear what you had to say yeah thank you So there you go. Thanks again to Lorna and to Finley. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, I, I think we're definitely going to have to do a larger episode on the projects that these guys are working on. And maybe that's something that we'll work on next year when we head back up for the Highland Ultra. Um, we'll spend a little more time with Lorna, with Finley, and with people elsewhere on the island working on other projects and, and really dig in the island. Even I've started referring to it as that. It feels like one so much. Okay. So there we go. That's about a wrap on the Highland Ultra for 2023. Um, It just remains for me to leave you with the world's happiest race director with another radness update from our man in America. And this is very thematically linked this week. We are, we're going to be hearing a little treatise here from our inspirational Adam Kimball on positive projects in the wider ultra running community and that connection that all of us involved feel with the outdoors and what we can do to give something back to the places that we love so much. Um, So there you go. I hope you've all had a good time listening to the episode this week. Uh, I know I had a brilliant time recording this one. Um, I hope you're feeling suitably inspired. If you want to know how you can get involved with any of the projects discussed in here, take a look below here. I'll have stuck some interesting links down there for you to take a look at. Beyond that, I'll speak to you again soon. Bye for now. Hello, everybody. This is Beyond the Ultimate Race Director, Adam Kimball, coming to you live from Northern California lake tahoe with another radness update today i wanted to talk a little bit about all of the wonderful things that that our community does kind of behind the scenes and and it ties in a lot to sort of the a big part of the ethos of btu and that is both leaving no trace and also leaving a place better than than we found it and um you know coming off of the highland ultra and all of the wonderful conservation projects that are happening uh, in that area of Scotland. It just makes me think about all of the BTU races and and all of the efforts that we make with the local teams to try to improve the areas. I think that's one thing that kind of sets our organization apart is, you know, there's a lot of great races out there, but not all of those races are as in tune and in sync with the local community and um, kind of figuring out the, the various ways that we can help build that up. And that's obviously a huge part of what we do. And I think it's a, a huge part of what makes what we do so special. And, you know, I was thinking about this in the context of BTU, but also just in the context of, of doing what you can within your own community. You know, like sometimes, sometimes we can hear about the various conservation projects and happenings of different organizations and, and think that's a really, a really neat thing and, and something that, uh, should be applauded, but maybe you don't realize how you can get involved and how you can help. And, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Just recently, I was with the uh, Western States organization, and we were out on the, the Western States Trail, and that um, is that race is coming up in just over a month. We're actually under five weeks now to race day. Uh, the iconic Western States Trail. Last year, there was a big fire called the Mosquito Fire, and if you weren't following that or weren't aware of what had happened, it caused a lot of destruction, and um, there was a a solid section of the course, 20-plus miles of the Western States course, that was impacted in some way. And so I went out with a a group of people on just one weekend, and they were – this organization goes out uh, on many, many trail work days. Like, they've been doing one literally every weekend for the last couple of months at least – but I went out and I helped repair the trails on this short um, little section, maybe, you know, maybe three miles long or so. And it just made me remember how important it is, I think, to to be a part of those kind of things when you have the opportunity. You know, there's not always trail work going on in your immediate area. Um, 
but there are ways to, to get involved and, and to give back to the community, whether it's volunteering at a race, um, supporting local efforts to uh, fundraise and, and build up other things within your community. And, and, you know, I think one of the best places to start is to think about yourself as a trail user and look at the places that you're actively um, going and, and recreating, right? So for me, living in Lake Tahoe, the Tahoe Rim Trail is a big one for me. I love running on that trail. The Pacific Crest Trail, um, also another very big trail, and there's a large section of that that comes through Northern California. And so I like to, to volunteer with those groups whenever they're doing trail work days or fundraising campaigns and do everything I can to support them because a lot of those organizations need as much help as they can get. Some of them are run entirely uh, through volunteers. A lot of them are nonprofits. And, and really, it's just all about doing what we can to give back to this incredible community. And so I just want to challenge everybody today to think a little bit about the things that you maybe I don't want to say take for granted, but maybe some some things that are part of your normal routine and maybe think to yourself, is there a way that I can kind of support this infrastructure and and do something to improve the areas that that I'm running in? And uh, and for me, you know, I, a lot of times I'm out there on these beautiful trails and and you can sort of get lost in in the fact that there's somebody or a group of people in almost all cases that that are actively keeping these trails maintained and, and doing work to, to make them better. And, you know, when there's a fire or damage to the trail, they're, they're rerouting it or rebuilding it and doing all these things. And so for me, it's really important to as often as possible, get in, in touch with that and, and get on the other side of that and think, wow, this doesn't just happen on its own, right? This is uh, this is something that requires a lot of hard work and a lot of people to do it. So it's, it's really rewarding when you can be a part of that. And I just want to encourage everybody to do that. And, and again, that's one of the reasons that I'm so proud to be a part of this BTU team, because that's something that we are actively thinking about at all times. It's, it's not only how can we put on a great race and, and help every one of our runners have an incredible experience, but it's also how can we make this sustainable uh, economically and with the with the locals in each of the locations of our races and and figure out how to you know best build up that community and that's something that I'm really proud of and, and grateful for and and uh, I hope that anybody that runs the BTU races uh, also recognizes how much goes into that because it's a really special thing so I'll just leave you with that look at the places that you're spending time in see what you can do to help and uh, as always you know, give back to this beautiful community that we all love so much.